Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Welcome to today's video. A fun short video, I said. A fun short video I thought it would be. I had this random thought the other day, yeah? You know how it's like a bit of a meme that Stephen King mentions a lot? I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder how many times he does mention in his books, in all of them. I wonder if anyone's ever done that before. That could be a fun idea every time Stephen King has mentioned badonkers in his stories. Guess what I spent 13 hours straight doing yesterday? Oh yeah, that's today's video. This video is sponsored by Extra. Extra is a debit card that helps build your credit and earns reward points just like a credit card. Credit building is an important function of today's world to either help you get a mortgage or get a loan from the bank. Now that I'm older, I have a pipe dream of one day owning a property of my own. And a card like Extra can really help that dream come into fruition. Now, all I need to do to achieve my dream of owning my own property is to stop eating so much avocado toast, lattes, and oh yeah, adopt some rich parents. Extra's mission is to make credit building safer and more accessible for everyone. That means there's 0% interest. There's also no credit check. So here's how it works. When you use your Extra debit card, Extra spots you for the purchase and automatically pays themselves back the next business day. At the end of the month, your payments are tallied and reported to major credit bureaus such as Equifax or Experian. As credit worthy payments, with Extra you can also earn up to 1% in points for your everyday purchases and spend your points on Extra's reward shop. So sign up for Extra with the link in my description and start building your credit with a debit card today. Thank you Extra for sponsoring this video because no one else would. Check out my top, you like it? It's mine, it's part of my merch, the Elise Easy, the AY clothing collection, so go check it out. <laughs> I'm actually a bit concerned because I don't know how long this video is gonna be. I thought, Oh, it's a fun meme idea. It's lighthearted. It's silly. It'll probably be like an hour long. I have a lot of screenshots, at least 800. I can't believe that I did this. There's only so many times the human brain can hear her firm breasts did something or they sagged with it. There's only so many times you can hear that. I had to read that over 800 times yesterday. Now, I haven't counted things like he took a pen from his breast pocket. There was a lot of that, by the way, there was a lot. Or they breasted over the hill. Didn't know that that was a term before, but Stephen King has used that about a hundred times. So, so I didn't count those. I counted things that actually related to the breast or objectifying the breast area, etc, etc. And also I feel like I have to say, I am a fan of Stephen King. I like Stephen King. I have read the majority of his work. He has written almost like 200 stories. You do not do that unless you like someone, but it's just one of those things that once you see, you cannot unsee. And once I read about it a few years ago, how he just always has to mention uh, the bazookas when he's talking about women, it's, <laughs> I was rereading the Tommy Knockers recently and it just stuck out like a sore thumb or a sagging tit. So without further ado, shall we begin? We're going to start in chronological order. So we're going to go all the way back to Carrie. I did all of his novels. I did all of his short stories. The short stories are usually part of a collection like Nightmares and Dreamscape. And then it'll have like, I know, 10 to 15 different stories in them. I've lumped them all together by collection. I haven't pointed out the individual short story it's from. And I actually did notice that in the short stories, there was less, like way less mention. It was in the longer ones where you'd get mentions of like 50 per book. I will also say in his defense, look, I really need to clarify that I like him, okay? Because imagine, <laughs> imagine this video actually does well and he stumbles upon it and he's like, what the hell? Look, I like you, Stephen King. In his defense, he has written a lot of stories. So sooner or later, you're going to start repeating terms, cliches, whatever. I'm pretty sure I had more to add in his defense, but I've totally forgotten. Without further ado, let's begin. Carrie has 14 <laughs> mentions. Carrie stood swaying between the showers and the wall with its dime sanitary napkin dispenser slumped over, breasts pointing at the floor, her arms dangling limply. She looked like an ape. Her eyes were shiny and blank. This is the video, by the way. I'm, re I'm reading out every mention to you. You're welcome. 
It was only then that he saw the baby, still partially wrapped in the placental membrane at Mrs White's breast. She had apparently cut the umbilical cord herself with the knife. I also like how out of context all of these are going to be. Carrie is about a teenage girl who's bullied and repressed by her overly religious mother and she gains telekinetic powers. I looked down and saw that my top had slipped while I was asleep. So I fixed it and said, those are my breasts, Carrie. More in his defence. Okay, more in his defence. Because I just think this is funny. This is just to lightly poke fun at someone. I'm not trying to make some big feminist statement here. I just thought it would be a funny video. Some of the books are told from the perspective of men. So it makes sense that some of them are pervy. Some of these books are told from the perspective of, uh, well, this book is about teenage girls and puberty and developing. So I can imagine that there would be some mentions of breasts, okay? <laughs> I could hardly believe it. And the first thing that popped into my mind also popped right out of my mouth. I said, well, I'm a good girl. And doesn't your mother have breasts? I don't know, does she? Do you want to ask? She unsnapped her heavy cotton bra and let it fall. Her breasts were milk white, upright and smooth. The nipples were a light coffee color. <laughs> <laughs> She ran her, I'm so immature. She ran her hands over them and a little shiver went through her. Evil, bad. Oh, it was. Because she is repressed, right? She's taught that any sign of femininity is an inherently bad thing in of itself. In of itself, that's what inherently means. But though this was only 9.20 in the morning, Carrie thought that the something had come to her. She ran her hands over her breasts. Dirty pillows. One gym class with no horseplay or little screaming catcalls and none of them were very surprised when Mrs. Desjardin slammed open the locker room and walked in. Her silver whistle dangled, <laughs> her silver whistle dangling between her small breasts and if her shorts were the ones she'd been wearing on Friday, no trace of Carrie's bloody handprint remained. Sue went over and slid carefully into the vacant side of Chris's booth. She was looking exceptionally pretty, her black hair held by a shamrock green band and a tight basque blouse that accentuated her firm up thrust breasts they're like thrusting up to the ceiling in defiance i'm also trying something a bit new with this because i hate my shotgun i hate it i can't stand it anymore right I'm trying so but i'm being really cautious of like because it's gonna anyway <laughs> rip headphone users her body, for the most part, was indeterminate. A baggy sweater concealed her breasts except for token nubs. The amount of times I've heard token nubs. Yeah, the amount of times I read it yesterday. She put the dress on for the first time on the morning of May 27 in her room. She had bought a special brassiere to go with it, which gave her breasts the proper uplift. Not that they actually needed it, but left their top halves uncovered. Wearing it gave her a weird dreamy feeling that was half shame and half defiant excitement. I can see your dirty pillows. Everyone will. They'll be looking at your body. The book says, those are my breasts, mama. Every woman has them. <laughs> he slid across the seat and kissed her, his hand moving heavily on her from waist to breast. His breath was redolent of tobacco and there was the smell of brile cream and sweat. She broke it at last and stared down at herself, gasping for breath. Her legs were trembling under her and suddenly, even with the comparatively high neck of her gown, her breasts, dirty pillows. This is the end, Billy. She backed away from him, breasts swelling into her bra, flat stomach pumping, legs long and tapering in her jeans. But she backed towards the bed. It's over. I guess breasts swelling in her bra means like she's just breathing, you're like puffing her chest out. A bit, a bit weird. Wait, no, they're just like blowing up like balloons and they pop. So that was Carrie. It's not so bad, is it? It was his first novel. It's all right. Don't worry. It gets worse and or funnier depending on the book. Don't worry. Moving on, we have Salem's Lot, which is about a town that gets besieged by vampires or vampire. I forget. It was a long time ago since I read it. Eleven <laughs> mentions. He slid his hand up and she arched her breast into it, soft and full. For the second time since he had known her, he felt 16, a head-busting 16 with everything in front of him, six lanes wide and no hard travelling in sight. One was taught that such things could not be, that things like Coleridge's Christabel or Bram Stoker's evil fairy tale were only the warp and woof of fantasy. Of course, monsters existed. They were the men with their fingers on the thermonuclear trigger in six countries. Only six. <laughs> A lot of changes in 50 years. The hijackers, the mass... 
I don't know if more countries, I don't know how many countries have nukes, I'm not going to pretend that I know that. The hijackers, the mass murderers, the child molesters, but not this. One knows better. Forgive me, I think I was vocal frying, which is not nice. The mark of the devil... <sighs> Do you know what? Maybe I'm just hitting puberty. I don't know. The mark of the devil on a woman's breast is only a mole. The man who came back from the dead and stood at his wife's door dressed in the cerements of the grave was only suffering from locomotor at ataxia. The boogeyman who gibbers and capers in the corner of a child's bedroom is only a heap of blankets. Some clergyman had proclaimed that even God, that venerable white warlock, was dead. That's nice, thanks for that. But most of all, the town has you because you know it the way you know the shape of your wife's breast. Why is everything <laughs> about boobs? It's too early to be saying that, but look, trust me, by the middle of this, you'll be like, why is everything about it? I forgot to mention, some parts of this were actually quite fun to do because, you know, there are books that I'd forgotten that I'd read. So it was nice. It was like kind of trip down memory lane. Or mammary lane. He says that he's my baby again, my own son, at my breast again. And I give him to suck, and, and then a feeling of sweetness with an undertone of bitterness, so much like it was before he was weaned, but after he was beginning to get teeth and he would nip. Oh, this must sound awful, like one of those psychiat psychiatrist things. <laughs> What's the matter, Corey? She put her hand on the door jam with a light deliberation, pulling her bare breasts up to their sauciest <laughs> ankle. At the same time, she crossed her feet demurely, modelling her legs for him. Oh, how quaint. The man from the telephone company, she asked and giggled. She took one of my hands and placed it on the firm flesh of her right breast. Want to read my meter? My guy clearly just wants to write a porno. Ben thought of using that hammer on Susan, using it to ram a stake between her breasts and felt his stomach flip over slowly like an aeroplane doing a slow roll. Where is the heart? Is it here or is it... I thought the heart was here. So we wouldn't need to go through, like... What's that going to get? I don't know. Stop looking at any opportunity to mention boobs. Now Callahan stepped forward and pressed his fingers against the springiness of her left breast. Here, he said. The heart. No, Ben repeated. I can't. Ed, she tried to say. Not now. It's too early. Not for almost nine years. But his hands were insistent, running over her belly, one finger toying with the cup of her navel, then both hands slipping up to catch her breasts with brazen knowledge. <laughs> Ruthie Crockett's shorty nightgown had twisted up above her thighs, showing a darker patch at their juncture that had been there for less than two years. Oh, yeah. Her perfect adolescent breasts rose and fell slowly in her deep sleep. Can you not? His eyes glittered over her, filling with the night reality of her slumbrous vitality, so deep that even in the deepest sleep, no cool hint of mortality could touch it. Her breasts pressed against each other in milky curves at the bodice of her nightdress. Stop! It's a teenager. Next, we have The Shining. I got the bibliography of Stephen King from some website where it showed it in chronological order. I find it interesting just how many of his first several books were such hits. You've got Carrie, Salem's Lot did well, The Shining, Rage, I found, I did find a copy online of Rage because you can't, uh, it's not in publication anymore, The Stand, the, I like The Long Walk, it's good, The Dead Zone, Firestarter, Roadwork, maybe not so much, Cujo, The Running Man had a film about it, then you got The Dark Tower, Christine, Pet Cemetery. we'll get to it, but it's just quite surprising how many of them, just straight off the bat, heavy hitters. So The Shining has 22 instances. <laughs> Anything that stings, she said. Her hands went to her elbows and cupped them. Her arms crossed over her breast. The amount of times I read her arms crossed over her breast. Could it just not be she crossed her arms? She crossed her arms. That's it. Don't need to know. Crossed over her breast. Just because you can't cross your arms any other way. I'm not going to assume if you say cross your arms that like characters walking around their arms crossed behind their back. Just saying. The woman in the tub had been dead for a long time. She was bloated and purple, her gas-filled belly rising out of the cold, ice-rimmed water like some fleshy island. Her eyes were fixed on Danny's, glassy and huge like marbles. She was grinning, her purple lips pulled back in a grimace. Her breasts lolled. Lol. Her pubic hair floated. Her hands were frozen on the knurled porcelain sides of the tub like crab claws. Tasty. Also, spoilers for anyone who hasn't read Stephen King books. There's probably going to be some spoilers amongst all the boobs. 
Still grinning, her huge marble eyes fixed on him, she was sitting up. Her dead palms made squittering noises. What's that sound like? No. On the porcelain. Her breasts swayed like ancient cracked punching bags. Stephen King, have you seen a punching bag? It's like, a punching bag is like this? Or does he mean like the little one that you're... Even, even so, even that like little one, that's still... I don't know. Why would they be that big if she's basically a corpse? Wouldn't it decompose? I'm thinking too much about this. There was the minute sound of breaking ice shards. She was not breathing. She was a corpse and dead long years. She crooned to Danny, rocking him on her breast. <laughs> That's his mum, not the ghost lady in the tub, by the way. So Danny told them, but his words came in cyclic bursts, sometimes almost verging on incomprehensible garbage in his hurry to spit it out and be free of it. He pushed... I can't talk. He pushed tighter and tighter against his mother's breasts as he talked. Her hand tightened painfully on his shoulder in her agitation, but he didn't move away. One hand found the firm weight of her left breast and he began to stroke it through her shirt. I'm assuming that's the dad, not the kid. <laughs> Wendy, he said and stopped. She waited for him to rearrange whatever he had to say. His strong hand on her breast felt good, soothing. Her face had paled. It looked shiny, almost ghostly. He continued to stroke her breast, rubbing the ball of his thumb gently over the nipple. She made a soft sound. From his words or in reaction to his gentle pressure on her breast, he couldn't tell. This is all in one scene, I think. He slipped her naked breast into the wide V of the open shirt, bent and moulded his lips around the stem of a nipple. The stem of the stem of the nipple like it's just flowers it was hard and erect yeah so was stephen king when he wrote this i'm joking he slipped his tongue slowly back and forth across it in a way he knew she liked wendy moaned a little and arched her back his mouth froze against her breast for a moment and then he sat up her own face was slightly flushed her eyes over bright jacks on the other hand was calm as if he had been reading a dull book rather than engaging in foreplay with his wife she was totally excited now, leaning over him, her breasts tumbling out of her shirt. He had a sudden impulse to seize one and twist it until she shrieked. Maybe that would teach her to shut up. <laughs> Can you not? He turned around. She had taken off her shirt and lay on the bed, her belly flat, her breasts aimed perkily at the ceiling. Aiming for what? They're not guns, aiming and firing. <laughs> Imagine that type of drive-by shooting. She was playing with them lazily, flicking at the nipples. Hurry up, gentlemen, she said softly. Time. Well, whatever floats your boat, lady. No. He jerked back to the reality of the bedroom, his eyes wide and staring, the screams tumbling helplessly from his mouth as his mother bolted awake, clutching the sheet to her breasts. Never just clutching them, it's always to the breast. It's like, to there? I don't know, if I was going to clutch sheets, it would be more like to the neck. Anyway... He looked back over his shoulder. They were all looking at him expectantly, silently. The man beside the woman in the sarong had removed his fox head and Jack saw that it was Horace Derwent, his pallid blonde hair spilling across his forehead. Everyone at the bar was watching too. The woman beside him was looking at him closely as if trying to focus. Her dress had slipped off one shoulder and looking down, he could see a loosely puckered nipple capping one sagging breast. Looking back at her face, he began to think that this might be the woman from 217, the one who had tried to strangle Danny. Derwent added his voice to the rest. A cigarette was cocked in one corner of his mouth at a jaunty angle. His right arm was around the shoulders of the woman in the sarong, and his right hand was gently and absently stroking her right breast. He was looking at the dog man with amused contempt as he sang. Yes, sir, Lloyd said, taking the glass. Lloyd looked perfectly normal again. The olive-skinned man had put his thirty-two away. The olive-skinned man had put his the olive the olive-skinned man had put his gun away. The woman on his right was staring into her Singapore sling again. One breast was wholly exposed now, leaning on the bar's leather buffer. A vacuous crooning noise came from her slack mouth. The loom of conversation had begun again, weaving and weaving. He's a good storyteller. I think he's a very good storyteller. Obviously, I think that I read all of his books. She was tall and auburn-haired, dressed in clinging white satin, and she was dancing close to him, her breasts pressed softly and sweetly against his chest. Her white hand was entwined in his. Danny's hand moved automatically toward the bolt. Wendy caught it and pressed it between her breasts. What, the bolt or his hand? <laughs> Danny shook his head against her breasts. He didn't know. It seemed there could never be spring again. He squeezed the accelerator like the breast of a much-loved woman and the... 
car scooted forward and toward the right. There was no embankment. Ooh, spooky. Why is everything always likened to boobs? She heard the mallet whistle through the air and then the agony exploded on her right side as the mallet head took her just below the line of her breasts, breaking two ribs. Could have just said hit her midriff, broke two rest, uh, ribs. Next, we have a story called Rage. I'm pretty sure I got all of this in order, but I might have got it wrong. I don't know. But this one, it's not in print anymore, but I found it online. It's about a boy who goes to school, shoots two of his teachers, takes the class hostage, but then they all start to talk about teenage angst, mental health, that kind of thing. And by the end of it, they sort of think he's a legend. It's also about mob mentality as well, because there's this boy called Ted and he goes against them. He He's like, can't you see that this guy is just crazy? And then they all end up beating him up into an almost catatonic state. It's about a lot of things, I suppose. Anyway, there's seven mentions. Did you shut your locker door? Sylvia Reagan asked. She was a big blonde girl with great soft cardigan breasts and gently rotting teeth. What a lovely description. She struggled for words. I could see her throat working as she tried them, rejected them, tried more, looking for words of power that would line Grace's face, drop her breasts four inches towards her belly, pop up varicose veins on those smooth thighs and turn her hair grey. Yeah, because when women don't like other women, what we really want is for their breasts to sag. I don't know. I don't think I've ever... I, no, I've never thought that about someone else. Oh, hope your breasts sag. What... It's gonna happen to everyone, isn't it? Who cares? Grace looked at the class, then looked at me. Her breasts were very full, pushing at the soft fabric of her sweater. This story is written from the perspective of a teenage boy, and if this was just a one-off book by Stephen King, he hadn't written anything else, so I'd be like, okay, it's just the perspective of a teenage boy. But because there's literally boobs mentioned in every single book, I think sometimes he just uses excuses to bring them up as much as possible. Sandra's hands made slow, ling gorous gestures. I suddenly knew that her natural habitat would be in a porch hammock at the very August height of summer, temperature 92 in the shade, reading a book, or perhaps just staring out at the heat shimmer rising over the road. A can of seven up beside her with an elbow straw in it, dressed in cool white short shorts and a brief halter with the straps pushed down, small diamonds of sweat stippled across the upper swell of her breasts and lower stomach. Mm, love having sweaty boobs in the summer. I can try, I told her, feeling a little absurd. I touched her breasts and she held me close, but my erection was still gone. What a tragic story. I looked at his face, at the flat, conventionally good-looking planes of his cheeks, at the forehead, barricading all those memories of summer country club days. Dances, cars, Sandy's breasts, calmness, the idea of rightness. And suddenly I knew what the last order of business was. Perhaps it had been the only order of business all along. And more importantly, I knew that his eye was the eye of a hawk and his hand was stone. He could have been my own father, but it didn't matter. He and Ted were both remote and Olympian. Gods. But my arms were too tired to pull down temples. I was never cut out to be Samson. Very, like, I don't know. In another one, my mother was giving me an anema. I think he's dreaming. I think this is just like a nightmare he's having. I don't think this is actually happened in the book. And I was begging her to hurry because Joe was outside waiting for me. Only Joe was there, looking over her shoulder, and he had his hands on her breasts while she worked the little red rubber bulb that was pumping soap studs into my ass. There were others featuring a cast of thousands, but I don't want to go into them. It was all Napoleon 16, 14 stuff. Thank you for that. Next up, we have The Stand, which has a whopping 32 <laughs> mentions. Stephen King, the type of guy to go bra shopping by himself. What is all of this? Lila screamed. What's wrong with my man? Are we going to die? Are my babies going to die? She had one baby in a headlock under each arm, their heads digging into her plentiful breasts. I still love you, Susan. This place sucks. Jerry, Clyde D. Fred, 1981. The stand is about a deadly virus that spreads throughout the world and kills off, what, like 97% of the world's population? and how they try to rebuild society afterwards. That's what this is about. There were pictures of large dangling penises, gigantic breasts, crudely drawn vaginas. It all gave Nick a sense of place. He was in a jail cell. The oral hygienist came in, wearing a pink nylon half slip and nothing else. Hi, Larry, she said. He, she was short, pretty in a vague Sandra D sort of way, and her breasts pointed at him perkily without a sign of sag. Why is he so obsessed with them sagging? What's that supposed to mean? She planted her hands on her hips, the greasy spatula sticking out of one closed fist like a steel flower. Her breast jiggled fetchingly, but Larry wasn't fetched. Really paints a picture, doesn't he? 
Sure, she said, cringing back and starting to cry. Why not? Big star. Flip and run. I thought you were a nice guy. You ain't no nice guy. Several tears ran down her cheeks, dropped from her jaw, plopped onto her upper chest. Fascinated, he watched one of them roll down the slope of her right breast and perch on the nipple. It had a magnifying effect. He could see pores and one black hair sprouting from the inner edge of the areola. Jesus Christ, I'm going crazy, he thought wonderingly. Yeah, me too. He felt a terrible and thankfully transient urge to bend down and touch the dead woman's breasts to see if they were hard or flaccid. I mean, when confronted by a dead body, who wouldn't want to touch their bits, am I right? Nick put his hand timidly against the side of her neck, then her inner wrist, then between her breasts. There was nothing. She was dead. I guess it does, Fran said wanly. His eyes were on her breasts again, dancing across them, and she wished for a sweater. I bet every female character in a Stephen King novel wishes for a sweater. <laughs> well, no, because even if they have a sweater or cardigan, they're not safe. Before that, she had been good in bed, so good that he was stunned. She had taken him back to this place after their lunch on the day they had met, and what had happened had happened quite naturally. He remembered an instant of disgust when he saw how her breasts sagged and how the blue veins were prominent. It made him think of his mother's varicose veins, for he had forgotten all about that when her legs came up and her thighs pressed against his hips with amazing strength. Larry, the musician, shags an old person because everyone else has died of the, the, the super flu. An old person, an old lady. The cupola atop Moses Richardson's barn was explosively hot. Sweat had been trickling down her body by the time they got to the hayloft, but by the time they'd reached the top of the rickety flight of stairs leading from the loft to the cupola, it was coursing down her body in rivers, darkening her blouse and moulding it to her... breasts. That's... Harold licked his lips, then looked at the side of the road, where Fran was still standing, hands cupping elbows, arms crossed just below her breasts, watching them anxiously. That's pretty disgusting. I'm inclined to agree, Harold. Well, she said, coming down the aisle to him. You ain't bad looking. That's something. <laughs> That's something. She put a hand on his arm. The swell of her breasts almost touched his arm. He could smell at least three different kinds of perfume, and under all of them, the unlovely aroma of her sweat. My name's Julie, she said. Julie Laurie. What's yours? She giggled a little. You can't tell me, can you? Poor you. She leaned a little closer and her breast brushed him. He began to feel very warm. What the hell? He thought uneasily. She's only a kid. Oh, Jesus. He put his hands out, perhaps meaning to take her by the shoulders, but he had found her breasts instead. That was the end of any resistance he might have had. So I think Nick, who is deaf and mute, has intercourse with this girl. And I'm pretty sure... Yes, I definitely read on the next page or so. After they have sex, he asks her age. She's 17. He's like a few years older, so it's fine. By a few, I think like he's 19 or whatever. Anyway, whatever, besides the point. But the fact that like he had sex with her and then asked her age <laughs> is a red flag. Hi, y'all. Julie trilled and ran down the street towards Tom, her breasts bouncing sweetly under the tight midi top. Blazes of purest white, attractive, startling hair. It was twisted into a cable that hung over one shoulder and trailed away only as it reached the swell of her... Stomach? No, breast. There had been a hot, sweet ball of excitement in her lower belly, and she had been very conscious of her breasts as sexual things, full and ripe and standing out from her chest. The moon had made her feel drunk, and so had the grass, wetting her legs with its night moisture. She had known that if the boy caught her, she would let the boy have her maidenhead. Stu slapped lazily at the mosquito hovering over his chest. His shirt was hung on a nearby bush. Fran's shirt was on but unbuttoned. Her breasts pushed at the cloth, and she thought, I'm getting bigger. Just a little right now, but it's noticeable, at least to me. I believe she's pregnant, so it's not, they're just not like magically growing. Then she broke from him and moved away, her face pale, her arms strapped across her breasts, hands cupping elbows, head lowered. Where had been his home? What sort of mother had held him to her breast? Why are the women in these books only referenced in relation to another man's proximity to their boobs? She passed a hand down from her neck to her thighs. The dressing gown she wore was silk, and she was naked underneath. Her hand passed smoothly over her breasts, and then, instead of continuing on flat and straight to the mild rise of her pubis, her hand traced an arc of her belly, following a curve that had not been this pronounced even two weeks ago. The big jock would be slipping it to the head cheerleader on some deserted lover's lane, while far away in suburbia, this plain girl with no breasts and a pimple in the corner of her mouth sang. She began to laugh. She put the washboard down on the sofa, came to him, 
and hugged him tight. His hands came up to her breasts and she hugged him tighter still. Not at all. She gave him that speculative glance again and turned halfway towards him. The silky material of her blouse pulled taut against her left breast, moulding it sweetly. He felt a hot flush creeping up his neck and willed himself not to have an erection. He suspected that his willpower would not be equal to the task. <laughs> My guy, just write an erotica. Anyone can do it. I've done it. Just do it. Her body was pressed frankly and completely against him. The first time in his life anything of the sort had happened and his amazement was total. He could feel the soft and individual press of each breast through his white cotton shirt and her silky blue one. Her belly, firm but vulnerable, against his, not shying away from the feel of his erection. There was a sweet smell to her, perfume maybe, or maybe just her own smell that seemed like a told secret that burst revelative on the listener. His hands were on her breasts and she was not minding. In fact, she was twisting and squirming around to allow his hands freer access. He did not caress her. In his frantic need, what he did was plunder her. Take care of you. The words echoed down in his mind like stones flung into a well and then he was sucking greedily at her breast, tasting the salt and sweet of her, like popcorn, salt and sweet. She shrugged and the movement made her breasts sway prettily, like swaying the winds, like corns. You know, like corns in a field. Sharp. Life will go on, won't it, Harold? I'll try to find some way of doing the thing that I have to do. You'll go on. Sooner or later, you'll find a girl who will do that one little thing for you. But that one little thing is very tiresome after a while. Very tiresome. I don't know what this is in relation to because I don't remember bum stuff? I don't know. She put her hand on her chest above the swell of her breast as if to quell the crazy beating of her heart. But her heart was not ready to slow yet. Hand on her hand. The woman on the bed was a skeleton covered with thinly stretched ash grey skin. She seemed without sex. Oh, what tragedy. She seemed without sex. Most of her hair was gone. Her breasts were gone. Her mouth hung unhinged and her breath rasped through it harshly. To Larry, she looked like pictures he had seen of the Yucatan mummies, not decayed, but shriveled, cured, dry, ageless, like beef jerky. She thought that the female body always looks its best when it is flat on its back, stretched out, the tummy pulled flat, the breasts naturally upright without the vertical drag of gravity to pull them down. <sighs> okay. She folded her arms below her breast, keeping the knife turned inward. Suppose I decline. What a cliffhanger. That's the end of that one. We are five books in. I have to take a break because I need to go to a Japanese lesson. So, aha, uh -huh. bye Elise in Katakana. See you in a bit. Let's continue. Next, we have The Long Walk. Nine mentions. <laughs> this is told from the perspective of a teenage boy. It's a dystopia where people can sign up to this game where they just keep walking and if you get free warnings, you die. By perspective, I mean third person, not first person. But even so, his mother was also tall, but too thin. Her breasts were almost non-existent. Token nubs. Drink every time Stephen King says token nubs. Don't do that. I don't want you to have to go to hospital for alcohol poisoning. They passed by a group of cheering teenagers sitting on a blanket and drinking Cokes. They recognised Garrity and gave him a standing ovation. It made him feel uncomfortable. One of the girls had very large breasts. Of course she did. Her boyfriend was watching them jiggle as she jumped up and down. Garrity decided he was turning into a sex maniac. What does that say about King then? Jan had long hair, almost to her waist. She was 16. Her breasts were not as big as those of the girl who had kissed him. He had played with her breasts a lot. It drove him crazy. She wouldn't let him make love to her, and he didn't know how to make her. She wanted to, but she wouldn't. Garrity knew that some boys could do. Ominous. His arms around her waist, her arms around his neck, locked there, her eyes closed. He had peeked. The soft feel of her breasts muffled up in her coat, of course, against him. He had almost told her that he loved her then, but no, that would have been too quick. He stared straight ahead, trying to remember just how it felt to kiss Jan, to touch her swelling breast. All of these people have swelling breasts. Do they have, is something going on? Are their chests made of balloons? It was Gribble. What a name. The radical among them. That suddenly dashed at them, his feet kicking up spurts of dust along the shoulder. One of them leaned back against the hood of the MG and spread her legs slightly, tilting her hips at him. Gribble put his hand over her breasts. She made no effort to stop him. He was warned, hesitated, 
and then plunged against her, a jamming, hurtled, frustrated, angry, frightened figure in a sweaty white shirt and cord pants. The girl hooked her ankles around Gribble's calves and pulled her, put her arms lightly around his neck. They kiss. It sounds like they're doing more than kissing, mate. He built her image slowly in his mind. Her small feet, her sturdy but completely feminine legs, small calves swelling to the... <laughs> Why is everything always swelling? These people are just walking around like big balloons to full earthy peasant thighs. Full earthy peasant thighs. What does that mean? Her waist was small, her breasts full and proud. <laughs> Imagine a, a female author or, or an author writing men like this. His testicles were small, perky, but proud. They still held firmly upright. Gravity hadn't claimed them just yet. In my, I don't think my breasts have ever felt proud in their life. The intelligent rounded planes of her face, her long blonde hair, whore's hair, he thought it for some reason. <laughs> That's his girlfriend he's talking about. Finally, they breasted it. Caroline had nice breasts. She often wore cashmere sweaters. And Stebbins, panting just a little, repeated, well? Well, what? The road was sunk between two sloping hills. The road was a cleft between two rising breasts. King has boobs so much on the mind that even the countryside is looking like a pair of titties. Next, we have a, the dead zone with only a paltry three mentions, but the main character does spend a lot of time in a coma and then starts to get visions of the future when he touches people. That's the premise of that book. It's a good book. The friend clicked away on high heels. The rest of them went on sitting, waiting their own chance to visit a father who had had gallstones removed. Gallstones? A mother who had discovered a small lump under one of her breasts a bare three days ago. Should this count? I think it should because, of course, yes, if a woman is going to get a lump, it's got to be in her boob and nowhere else, right, King? <laughs> she froze and he could hear an ivory click as her teeth came suddenly... Did they? How? And violently together. Her hand pressed against her chest just above the swell of her breasts. A small gold crucifix hung there. Oh my God, she said, you're awake. I thought you looked different. How did you know my name? The wind outside sobbed around the eaves like a lost child. Halfway up, he glanced back. Henrietta Dodd sat in a wicker chair, a sprawled mountain of meat, <sighs> gasping and holding a huge breast in each hand. His head foot still felt as if it was swelling and he thought dreamily, pretty soon it will just pop and that will be the end. Thank God. Yeah, one could only hope. I'm... Gonna jump, double check something because I'm very sure that there's a sex scene in the dead zone and his ex-girlfriend's breasts are replied as like, replied? Uh, described as gravity had not got, it's something, something. Well, nuts to that. Firestarter is next. Only two mentions, thank goodness, because it is about a little girl, preteen girl who has telekinetic powers or can start fires same thing. He came out of the doze a little at a time. The Ratch Maninoff was gone, if it had ever been there at all. Vicky was sleeping peacefully on the cot beside him, her hands folded between her breasts, the simple hands of a child who was who had fallen asleep while offering her bedtime prayers. The head leaned back in Cap's chair and laced her hands behind her neck. The man who was not a librarian eyed appreciatively the way her sweater pulled taut against the rounds of her breast. Cap had never been like this. Well, Cap hadn't, but Stephen King had. Next, we have road work with 10 mentions. Is this a good video? I was in two minds about doing this. Halfway through doing the screenshots, I started to think, what am I doing? But I was in too deep, right? When the screenshots got past about 400 screenshots, my new moon video had 392 screenshots of text. So when I got past the 400 mark for this, I started to think, is this even a good idea? But I was too in it, I had to do it. This is gonna be a very long video, so I'm a bit concerned. But then again, Mr. Beast uploaded a 23 hour long video of him counting to 100,000, so... He sat down beside her and pecked her cheek. She was a tall woman, 38 now, and at that crisis of looks where early prettiness is deciding what to be in middle age. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen King. Her skin was very good, her breasts small and not apt to sag much. She ate a lot, but her conveyor belt metabolism kept her slim. Oh, that is the male fantasy, isn't it? A girl who can eat as much as you, like with you guys, you know, eat like loads and loads of pizza, but never put on weight. The Gilmore girl effect, I might call it. I'm gonna call, I came up with that. 
I'm not the first person to mention this at all. Was what a load of rubbish. Ooh, she ate a lot when the lads, but what am I talking about? I just feel personally offended because I want to eat a lot, but my metabolism won't like it. He considered the question, watching the play of lamplight across the lovely round curves of her breast. She had been so much slimmer then. Although she's hardly a fatty now, George, he reproached himself. Never said she was, Freddie, my boy. Fred and George, is that you? So much more alive somehow. Even her hair had cracked, crackled out its own message. Alive, aware, awake. That's quite a thing for some hair to be saying, isn't it? We always find time for that, she said, and laughed, and blushed. And her eyes were dark in the lamplight, and it threw a warm, semicircular shadow between her breasts. And he knew then that he was going to give in to her. He would have promised her a $1,500 Zenith console model. What the hell is that? If she would just let him make love to her again. And at the thought, he felt himself stiffening. Felt the snake turning to stone. As Mary had once said when she'd had a little too much to drink at the Red Pass New Year's Eve party. And now, 18 years later, he felt the snake turn to stone again over a memory. I haven't recapped Roadwork because I haven't watched it. I don't know what it's about. From the context of these little clips, it's just this dude constantly comparing his new lover to his ex-wife. There's a fly buzzing around. I'm not happy. It got in when I opened the door and then it won't leave when I told it to leave. So what am I supposed to do, huh? She pounced on him, giggling. Her breaths, her breaths, breasts a soft weight on his stomach. Flat enough in those days, Freddy. Not a sign of a bay window. That's the trick of it. Who are these people? The 1940s called. Once it's vernacular back. From the look of the lamplight on her small, up-tilted breasts. Why do you keep telling us that they're small? Leave her alone. For the dare you grin on her lips and in her eyes, her dark eyes, which could sometimes turn so light or darken even more into summer thunder heads. I metabolize it all away, he told her. Oh, it was, it was him saying that. <laughs> Not being like a teehee manic pixie dream girl. I can eat loads of bread and it's fine. And went through the doorway. He brushed her breast primly broad by the feel on the way by. It felt a way Mary's breasts hadn't felt in years. It was maybe not such a good way to think. Mm. But it wouldn't come, not the way he wanted it. He couldn't remember the precise tight feel of her breasts or the secret taste of her nipples. Ooh, secret. What are you talking about? What do you mean secret taste of her nipples? What do they taste like? Olive oil. I only said olive oil because I, I, I looked at this. I looked at this. He knew that the actual friction of intercourse had been more pleasurable with her than with Mary. Olivia, oh yeah, this is why I included this bit. Olivia had been a snugger fit and once his penis had popped out of her vagina with an audible sound, like the pop of a champagne cork. I'm sorry, when has this ever happened? <laughs> But he couldn't really say what the pleasure had been. Instead of being able to feel it, he wanted to masturbate. The desire disgusted him. Furthermore, his disgust disgusted him. She wasn't holy, he assured himself as he sat down to eat his TV dinner. Just a tramp on the bum. To Las Vegas yet, he found himself wishing that he could view the whole instant with Maglory's jaundiced eye. And that disgusted him most of all. I am the most disgusted here. The woman in the black dress kissed him warmly on the lips, the, her ample breasts pushing against his chest. Some of her martini fell on the floor between them. Well, serves them both right, doesn't it? She looked at him warmly, speculatively, and Bart could barely believe that this woman had given him his first touch of female flesh. The sophomore class trip at Grover Cleveland High School, 109 years ago, rubbing her breasts through her white cotton sailor blouse beside. He had done things he never would have done otherwise. Bum stuff. The trips on the turnpike, as mindless and free as migration. The girl and the sex, the touch of her breast, so unlike Mary's. Poor Mary. Stop dabbing on Mary. What has Mary done to deserve this? I wouldn't know because I've not read it. <laughs> Next we have Cujo, which is about a rabid dog that holds a mother and child hostage in a car at kind of a semi-abandoned garage. There's 10 mentions of boobs in this, somehow. Don't talk to me like that, Donna. His hand moved to her breast and squeezed. It hurt. She began to feel a little scared as well as angry. But hadn't she been a little scared all along? Hadn't that been part of the nasty, scuzzy little thrill of it? Yes, probably he is. But she crossed her arms over her breasts and cupped her elbows in the palms. I mean, that's just uncomfortable and unnatural. 
That's more... No- okay, whatever. A characteristic gesture of nervousness with her. He put his hand on her shoulder. He dropped it to one of her breasts. He squeezed it. Come on, he said. I'm horny. Wow, talk about foreplay. Don't say it, don't say it. Mrs. King sure is lucky. Joel, with all the royalties Stephen made the other day, from my many purchasing of the books, he should take Mrs. King, Tabitha, out for a nice meal. Tad buried his face against her breast just as Cujo struck the windshield again. Foam smeared against the glass as he tried to bite his way through. Her heart thudded heavily in her breast as she weighed the chances. Can't just be her heart thudded heavily. Even in her chest, right? Or, I don't know, you know when your heart beats so hard that you can feel it in other areas of your body? Like, you feel in your eyelid or, or your throat or whatnot. You can feel your pulse going out. It's always got to be <laughs> in her breast. It was as if someone had slung a medicine ball right into the soft, vulnerable flesh of her breasts. She could feel them push out towards her ribs. It hurt. That made him think of his own daughter, Katrina, who would be going into the seventh grade this year. She was getting breasts now, becoming quite the little lady. Piano lessons, wanted a horse. Hmm, we've still got about a hundred books to get through. Holding Tad against her breasts, Donna turned her head in time to see Cujo strike the man as he tried to swing into his car. Rip. The St. Bernard shied away, growling. Her breasts rose and fell rapidly in the white cotton bra. The cups were bloodstreaked. She had wiped her hands on them after clearing Tad's mouth. Her looks were almost entirely gone. There were wrinkles around her eyes. Her breasts sagged. Even in her bra, they sagged. There were only six years between them, but an observer might as well have thought it was more like 16. Okay, cool. Thanks. Cheers. Next up is The Running Man, a film about, again, a guy in a dystopian game show where he has to run away from these... That is what it's about, right? He has to run away from some punters and not get caught, and then he wins money. I'm pretty sure it had Arnie in it, didn't it? Am I thinking of something else? Anyway, it's about some sort of dystopia and it's this man on the run, hence the running man. Even so, there's still five mentions of boobs. The picture dissolved to a still of Sheila, but the airbrush had been at work again, this time wielded with a heavier hand. The results were brutal. The sweet, not so good looking face had been transformed into that of a vapid slattern. (laughs) Full pouting lips, Eyes that seemed to glitter with avarice. A suggestion of a double chin faded down to what appeared to be bare breasts. A suggestion of a double chin. Shut up. Leave this person alone. I'm going to be like this the whole time now. The door swung open and Richards looked away at a scrawny woman with no breasts and huge knotted hands. Her face was unlined, almost cherubic. Them little angel things. He jammed the gun against her right breast and she whispered, don't please. Oh my goodness. On the other side, the left, were the poor people. Don't know why I say it like that. It's how it reads. Get ready for this description. Red noses with burst veins, flattened sagging breasts, stringy hair, white socks. White socks. Cold sores pimples, the blank and hanging mouths of idiocy. White socks. Did anyone see that Jack Make Happy Hour podcast guest recently with a Liverpudlian comedian called Adam Rowe? And they were talking about what means, what, uh, if you're a wool or not. I'm so sure. Oh my God. I've just double checked that so many times because I didn't want to get it wrong. Because for some reason, Leeds kept popping into my head. But no, Liverpool, Scousers. I just really didn't want to get that wrong because I don't want to be beaten up by all of the North. To me, the North is anything above Hampstead Heath. But there was a whole... (laughs) They had this whole chat about uh, ways you can see if someone's actually from Liverpool or not. And it was something, something purple bins and also some, like, people wearing white socks or... That's what this sounds like. Red noses, flattened sagging breasts, stringy hair, cold sores, pimples... Idiots. White socks. What? Richards noticed for the first time how perfect her breasts were beneath the blood-stained black and green blouse. How perfect and how precious. The next excerpts are from The Gunslinger, the first book in the Dark Tower series. I only read the first two 
of the, I haven't finished the series. Now I'll be able to because I bought the ebooks. The gunslinger's quarry came in a rickety rig with a rippling tarp tied across its bed. There was a big howdy do with a grin on his face. They watched him come, an old man Kennelly, lying by the window of a bottle in one hand and the loose hot flesh of his second eldest daughter's left breast in the other, resolved not to be there if he should knock. Lovely. Ali was naked, the sheep below her breasts, and they were preparing to make love. No description could take the measure of the woman. Breasts like earthworks. What does that even mean? The girl looked at him bovinely, like, like a cow. Her breasts thrust with an overripe grandeur at the wash-faded shirt she wore. What do you mean overripe? Boobs aren't bananas. They're not like... Buying one minute, minute, then like two ripe the next set. What are you talking about? The hawk had landed beside its prey and was complacently tearing into its plump white breast. A few feathers seesawed slowly downward. I included this because not even the birds are safe from Stephen King. She pressed over him, a body made of the wind, a breast of fragrant yasmin, rose and honeysuckle. What is she? The three wise men that visited Jesus? Someone who wasn't brought up religious... I do mention the Bible a lot, don't I? I know my biblical law. The thread that held the last jewel at the breast of the world was on... F even, even the world's got... Bre even the earth has boobies. Forbidden to all but a few. In the heavy vault under the barracks where he by ancient law was now required to abide, away from his mother's breast, hung his apprentice weapons. I think I include this because it's not, oh, just away from your parents, away from your mum. No, it's away from your mum's tip. All women referenced in relation to what their boobs mean to a bloke. Next is Christine, which is about a car that runs people over. 14 instances. The times that I do beat him mean more. We played cribbage, and after a while my mother came in, her colour high and her eyes glowing, looking too young to be my mum, her book of stories and sketches clasped to her breast. She kissed my father, not her usual brush, but a real kiss that made me feel all of a sudden like I should be someplace else. I'll tell you all about it if you take me up the embankment for a while, she said, pressing my arm against the soft side swell of her breast. If you want to talk, that is. She smiled up at me, her eyes wide and sweet in a little daze as they always were. She held my arm even more tightly against her breast. These women manipulating all these men just with a little bit of side boob. Ha! Huh, classic. Love them, I said. I should maybe have been thinking about the promise of her breast. But instead I found myself thinking about Arnie. But Lee Cabot was just as beautiful with no qualifications. Her skin was fair and perfect, usually with a touch of perfectly natural colour. She stood about five feet eight. Tall for a girl, but not too tall. Ha! It's me. I'm five foot eight. Tall for a girl, but not too tall. Oh. And her figure was lovely. Firm, high breasts, a small waist that looked as if you could almost put your hands around it. Anyway, you longed to try. Nice hips, good legs, beautiful face. Sexy, smooth figure. Artistically dull, I suppose, without a too long lower lip or a sharp nose or a wrong bump or bulge anywhere. Not even an endearing crooked tooth. She must have had a great orthodontist too, but she sure didn't feel dull when you were looking at her. His hand had slipped up under the t-shirt she was wearing and had found the soft glory of her breasts, capped with nipples that were tight and hard of excitement. Her breath came in short, steep gasps. Her breath came in short, steep gasps. And for the first time, her hand had gone where he had wanted it, where he needed it, into his lap, where it pressed and turned and moved, without experience but with enough desire to make up for the lack. She felt irritated, chafed, out of sorts with herself, unfulfilled, she supposed, there was a dull ache in her breasts. She loved the feel of his hands on her body, her breasts, her thighs. She had not yet allowed him to touch the centre of her, but she wanted his hands there. She thought if he touched her there, she would probably just melt. She hugged him, her arms locked around his neck. Her coat was still open, and he could feel the soft, maddening weight of her breasts. But it was a long time, perhaps 20 minutes, before Lee came downstairs wearing a caramel-coloured sweater that clung lovingly to her breasts, and a new pair of cranberry-coloured slacks that clung lovingly to her hips. Suddenly, there were arms around her, crushing, and a pair of hard hands were clasped together in a knot just below her breasts, in the hollow of her solar plexus. And suddenly, one thumb popped up, the thumb of a hitchhiker signalling for a ride, only the thumb drove painfully into her breastbone. Until now, it was infuriating to be so smoothly and seamlessly balked by this boy. 
who had once drawn milk from her breasts. I thought you were smart, but you're stupid. The spice of danger had added something to what I felt for her, and I think to what she felt for me. He was my best friend, but there was still a dirty, senseless attraction in the idea that we were seeing each other behind his back. I felt that every time I drew her into my arms, each time my hand slipped over the firm swelling of her breasts, the sneaking around. Can you tell me why that should have an attraction? But it did. For the first time in my life, I had fallen for a girl and her massive bazonkers. Bazonkers, bazonkers and bazookas mixed together. There were nights after love when we would lie together in bed, naked, belly to belly, and that thing would be between us, Roland D. LeBay's face. I would be kissing her mouth or her breasts or her belly, warm with rising passion, and I would suddenly hear his voice. That's about the finest smell in the world, except for... Oh. And I would freeze, my passion all steam and ashes. Pet Cemetery, which is about a cemetery that can bring people back from the dead, including pets. Eight <laughs> mentions. Gage was cutting teeth and fussed almost ceaselessly. He would not sleep, no matter how much Rachel sang to him. She offered him the breast, even though it was off his schedule. Gage knew his dining schedule as well as she, maybe better, and he promptly bit her with his new teeth. I don't know why people bother having kids. He looked around. A woman dressed in slacks and a brown sweater stood hesitantly in the doorway, one hand clutched into a fist between her breasts. Why? The mother of the ghost, Lewis thought. His snap judgment was that she was scared but not helpless. She opened her mouth. Stale denture breath wafted out. And Lewis felt a moment of aching sorrow for her lying here on the kitchen floor in a litter of apples and Halloween candy. It occurred to him that once she had been 17, her breasts eyed with great interest by the young men of the neighbourhood. Yeah, because that perfectly encapsulates being 17, doesn't it? Shine boys look at your boobs. I mean, sure, humans, teenagers, whatever. Like, I'm sure, everyone's horny to a degree. But it's like, once she had been 17, her boobs. Like, there was no nothing else in her life once she'd been 17 and... I don't know, maybe had hopes for the future? No, boobs. And then all of her teeth her own and the heart under her shirt waist, a tough little pony engine. He remembered one of the guys he played poker with, Wick Sullivan, asking him once how he could get horny for his wife and not get horny for the naked woman he saw day in and day out. Lewis had tried to explain to him that it wasn't the way people imagined in their fantasies. A woman coming in to get a pap smear or to learn how to give herself a breast self-examination didn't suddenly drop a sheet and to stand there like Venus on the half shell. Lewis is a doctor, right? There's nothing sexy or arousing about getting a pap test. Smear, whatever. Cervical examination. There is nothing... Makes me cringe even thinking about it. There is nothing sexy about that. Just... Moving on. You saw a breast, a vulva, a thigh. The rest was draped in a sheet and there was a nurse in attendance. More to protect the doctor's reputation than anything else. Wiki wasn't buying it. A tit is a tit, was Wiki's thesis. You should either be horny all the time or none of the time. All Lewis could respond with was that your wife's tit was different. But Wiki sounds like a moron. I wonder if people were never told, boobs, they're sexy. They're, they, they arouse you. Da, 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 da. People were never told that. Would they still find boobs attractive? If you, if you had no frame of reference, you didn't have the media having, you know, people in bikinis or you didn't have this great emphasis on, you know, sex appeal, massive badongas. I'm so childish. <laughs> I have zero sex appeal. But if you were never told it, would you still find it attractive? They continued this delightful chat. What he hadn't been able to make Wiki understand was that doctors compartmentalised just as cheerfully and blindly as anyone else. A tit wasn't a tit unless it was your wife's tit. In the office, another woman's tit wasn't a tit. It was a case. Case of what? Harassment? These books are. Lewis comforted her, held her and comforted... Comforted her again. He felt her tears on his collar, the press of her breasts against him. Ah, yes, my wife, you're upset and I must comfort you. Let me first make note that I can feel your boobs. He slept as Ellie quieted at last and lay shuddering against her mother's breast, eyes wide and tearless. I understand everything, because I'm a genius. I understand that... This is a comforting thing. The, 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 the very various mentions of children being at their mother's breasts in these books. It's a comforting thing, even though it's sort of sprinkled amongst all the other cases of objectifying the breasts, right? Because a little child wants to be comforted, so they're hugging their mum. But look, boobs, 
they can be sen- <laughs> they can be censored, they can be sensitive, they can be tender. It just I think it'd be annoying having little kids always trying to hug you all the time. What if like they're hurting one day? You know what I mean? And breastfeeding as well. That hurts people, doesn't it? Oh God. God, we really got the short end of the stick, didn't we? Jesus. What did I ever do to deserve it? The crypt's double doors were set into the grassy rise of a hill, a shape as natural and as attractive as the swell of a woman's breast. My man goes out for a scenic walk amongst nature and pops a stiffy at every hill he sees. Next up is the talisman. Not read it, don't know what it's about. 11 mentions. All but one of the pictures were nudes cut from men's magazines. Oh great, here we go. Women with breasts as large as their large as their heads lolled back against uncomfortable trees and splayed columnar hard-worked legs. To Jack, their faces looked both fascinating and rapac- rapacious, as if these women would take bites out of his skin after they kissed him. Some of the women were no younger than his mother. Others seemed to be only a few years older than himself. Yeah, that's that's what you want when you're a bloke, to look at a men's magazine and immediately think of your mum. A young woman with a dirty baby at one huge breast told him she could teach him something to do with his little man besides let piss out of it if he had a coin or two. <laughs> what, a, what a delightful proposal, madam. Jack blushed again. He saw the girl's large white breast, its nipple in the dirty, dirty baby's working mouth. Ooh, this pretty young man shy. Madam, please, you're breastfeeding. Can you go sit down or something? <laughs> a large silver crucifix dangled between her breasts. There were a few boys who told tattletale lies to those so-called news people, Gardner said. I heard the lies repeated on that news TV show. And although the boys slinging that mud were too cowardly to show their faces on the screen, I knew, oh yeah, I knew those voices. When you fed a boy, when you've held his head tenderly against your breast when he cries from his mama in the night, why? I guess then you know his voice. The depot's low ceiling was only four inches or so above his head. He must have been 70. He might have been a fairly well-preserved 80. A snowy white beard begun under his eyes and cascaded down over his breast in a spray of baby fine hair. Sometimes I'm including the men in this because Stephen King is just like an equal breast opportunist. The alligator thing ran with slow, clumsy, thudded determination. Its eyes sparkled with murderous fury and intelligence. The vestiges of breasts bounced on its scaly chest. Even reptilians can't catch a break. Even they are being objectified. <laughs> Above her pale body with its drooping breasts and mop of pubic hair, her face had been painted blazing orange. Orange too was her hair. Baby, a woman whispered from the next house. Sweet baby Jason. This time he did look. You're dead now. She stood just on the other side of a broken little window, twiddling the chains that had been inserted inserted in her nipples, smiling at him lopsidedly. Jack stared at her vacant eyes and the woman dropped her hands and hesitantly backed away from the window. The length of the chain drooped between her breasts. Still sleeping himself, the wolfling put his arms around his mother's shaggy neck and pressed his cheek against her downy breast. And now they smiled. In her alien sleep, a human thought arose. God pounds his nails true and well. I have no idea what this book is about, but there is a lot going on. There's like werewolves and reptilians and boobs. This book has everything. Oh my God, that boy is there. He's there, Buddy Parkins thought. And although he had no idea of where there was, was suddenly overtaken by a sweet, violent feeling of absolute adventure. Never since reading Treasure Island at the age of 12 and cupping a girl's breast in his hand for the first time at 14, had he felt so staggered, so excited, so full of warm joy, he began to laugh. Next up, we have Thinner, which was released under his pseudonym, Richard Backman. I also like this story. It's about a man who gets cursed. He's obese and then just starts losing weight and two other people in his town get cursed as well because they accidentally killed a lady of the Roma people. So they get cursed. She put her arms around him and hugged him hard. He could feel the tempting swell of her breasts against his chest. Want to go upstairs? She looked at him, her eyes dancing. My, you are okay, aren't you? You bet. They went upstairs and had magnificent sex for one of the last times scandalous if i could only do something she sobbed if i could only do something billy you know you can he said and touched her breast so much for foreplay for these men right they made love it it worked it worked just touched her boob it worked he began thinking 
This one is for her, and discovered it had been for himself after all. Ugh, what a selfish person. Instead of seeing Leda Rosington's haunted face and shocked glittering eyes in the darkness, he was able to sleep. Why don't you get it from them? He crossed slabby, flabby arms. <sighs> yeah. Under his shirt, his large breast jiggled. Her eyes widened again. Her breasts heaved as she opened her mouth and drew in a breath. Next up, we have It. I'm sure you all know what It is about. It is probably one of his most famous novels about a evil force in the town of Derry and some kids have to stop it. There are 33 mentions. It is a long book, so. And the three of you came in to make a clean breast of things. Chief Radamaka and I appreciate that, don't we, Andy? I think I included this because make a clean breast of things. I don't think I've ever heard that term before. I think he just makes stuff up, like the whole we breasted the hill. I'd never heard that before, before King. I think he's just making it up so he can mention boobs. She moved in front of him, blocked off the stairway, and at first he thought she would not give way. Then, when his face was about to crash into the soft roadblock of her breasts, she did give way, fearfully. As he walked past, never slowing, she burst into miserable tears. Tom was nearly asleep when the phone rang. He struggled halfway up, leaning towards it, and then felt one of Beverly's breasts press against his shoulder as she reached over him to get it. He stood there for a moment, staring at her as if he had never seen her before, in a way he never had. Her breasts heaved rapidly. Her face all flushed and livid pallor blazed. And suddenly, maybe it was because of the utter loathing on her face, the contempt, maybe because she had called him a tub of guts, or maybe only because of the rebellious way her breasts rose and fell, the fear was suffocating him. It was not a bud or a bloom, but a whole goddamn garden, the fear, the horrible fear that he was not here. It was this latter Beverly who swung the belt for the last time, the belt he had used on her buttocks, her legs, her breast. The belt he had used on her at times without number over the last four years. Two with the belt. Bev's working late at the studio and forgets to call home. Three with the belt. Oh hey, look at this. Beverly got another parking ticket. One with the belt. Across the breasts. He was good. He rarely bruised. They are in bed together during this conversation. Her breasts are small like peaches. Sweet like peaches. Peaches are like, like this big, aren't they? He loves her a lot. Although not the way they both know would be a really good way to love. He could tell by the look in her eyes. They were deep and thoughtful and far off. Not the eyes of a school teacher in her forties, but those of a child. Her hands were folded just below her breasts, as if in a prayer. Sure, she said. Thank you very much. Think of it. My first date. Just wait until I write it in my diary tonight. She clasped her hands together between her budding breasts, fluttered her eyelashes rapidly. I'm losing, I'm losing the will to... Beverly always woke up when the alarm went off in her parents' bedroom. You had to be fast because the alarm no more than got started before her father banged it off. She dressed quickly while her father used the bathroom. She paused, as she now almost always did, to look at her chest in the mirror, trying to decide if her breasts had gone any bigger in the night. She had started getting them late last year. There had been some faint pain at first, but that was gone now. They were extremely small. Not much more than spring apples. How big's a spring apple? What a strange unit of measurement. They were quite small. No bigger than a tiny teacup pig. What do you mean? So when he's writing from a male perspective, there's always mention of boobs. However, when he's writing from a female perspective, there's also mention of boobs. The, the women in the Stephen King novels think more about their tits than I've ever thought of mine in my life. Do you know what I mean? They're always like thinking about their boobs or like playing a bit with their boobs or whatever. Like it's kind of like... <laughs> It's it's so typical. It's such a typical men writing women thing. Boobs, they're just a part of our body. I don't think of them any more than I think of like my hand. You know, they're just there. It's just a matter of fact. Big deal. I've always had them, so I don't think of them. Unless like like I'm feeling a pain or something, you know? And I'm never looking at them thinking, oh yes, perky. Gravity hasn't thwarted me just yet. It's very, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. She shivered, hugging her arms across her breasts in an X, cupping her elbows in her palms. Don't think I've ever... It's not comfortable. That's more comfortable. Now I look like a... Like, I'm in a straight jacket. <sighs> what do you mean? Had she begun menstruating at 11? Surely not. Although her breasts had begun their first achy growth around midwinter. I don't need the law of some child's boobs. Thank you. Oh yeah, you got that right, Beverly says flatly. 
Patrick Hotstetter was crazy. None of the girls would sit in front of him at school. You'd be sitting there doing your arithmetic or writing a story or a composition, and all at once you'd feel this hand, almost as light as a feather, but warm and sweaty. Meaty. Blah. She swallows, and there is a small click in her throat. The others watch her solemnly from around the table. You'd feel it on your side, or maybe on your breast. Not that any of us had much in the way of breasts back then, but Patrick didn't seem to care about that. She throws her arms around him and kisses him. On the lips, on the lips. I love you, Ben, she sobs. He can feel her small breasts pressing firmly against his chest. And <laughs> Beverly was standing near the drain. She looked down at herself and that coldness disappeared in a flush that seemed to turn all of her skin into one warm stocking. It must have been a deep breath indeed. The dim popping sounds had been the buttons on her blouse. They were gone, every single one of them. The blouse hung open and her small breasts were clearly revealed. She snatched the blouse closed. The others had also looked and then looked away. Richie coughed against the back of his hand. Stan turned red. And Mike Hamlin dropped a step back or two as if actually frightened by the side smell... A swell, not, a swe not a smell. Of that one small white breast visible below her hand. The word he didn't know on the concept, he was very clear. Looking at them when they were looking at each other that way would be as wrong as looking at her breasts when she let go of the blouse. I can't even read. To pull Bill's t-shirt over her head. If that's the way it is, but you'll never love her the way I do. Never. It always comes back to power. I love Beverly Marsh and she has power over me. She loves Bill Denbra, so he has power over her. But I think he is coming to love her. Maybe it was her face, how it looked when she said she couldn't help being a girl. Maybe it was seeing one breast for just a second. <laughs> Typical. Typical boys. Oh, I love her. I got to see a little bit of titty. My one true love finally showed me a bit of side boob. All I can think of now is that bit in Family Guy where Peter's being like, do you like that side boob? <laughs> or how about that side boob? That's a nice side boob. And then he's like, how about this one? Does it turn you on? Well, it shouldn't, because that's my side boob. <laughs> the touch of her hand was suddenly both wonderful and necessary. He wondered what it would be like to touch her breasts for the second time in his life, and suspected that before this long night was over, he would know. Fuller now, mature, and his... <laughs> mm, like Cathedral City cheddar cheese. And his hand would find hair when he cupped the swelling of her... M Mons Venerids. He thought, I loved you, Beverly. I love you. Ben loved you. He loves you. We love you then. And we love you now. We better because it's starting. No way out now. Oh yeah, so he cheats on his wife just cause. What a douchebag. Something in his face. He was looking at her chest. She was suddenly aware that her blouse be had become untucked, that some of the buttons had popped off and that she wasn't wearing a bra. As of yet, she only owned one bra, a training bra. Her mind sideslipped back to the house at Neil Bolt Street when Bill had given her his shirt. She had been aware of the way her breasts poked at the thin cotton material, but their occasional skittering glances had not bothered her. These had seemed perfectly natural, and Bill's look had seemed more than natural. It had seemed warm and wanted, if deeply dangerous. Her kiss was firm and warm and sweet. Her breasts pushed against his open coat and her hips moved against him, away and then against him again. They're adults at this point. It flicks between children to adult, child to adult. When her hips moved away a second time, he plunged both his hands into her hair and moved against her. When she felt him growing hard, she uttered a little gasp and put her face against the side of his neck. He felt her tears on his skin, warm and secret. The door opened. They were inside. She looked at him, eyes bright, cheeks flushed, her breasts rising and falling rapidly. He took her in his arms and was overwhelmed by the feeling of rightness, the feeling of the circle between past and present closing with a triumphant seamlessness. He kicked the door shut clumsily at one foot and she laughed her warm breath into his mouth. My heart, she said, and put his hand on her left breast. He could feel it below that firm, almost maddening softness, racing like an engine. <laughs> Not an angel. He stripped off his socks and shirt and got in next to her. She pressed against him, her breasts warm, her long legs cool. <laughs> Why is she so many different temperatures? What's going on? Bill held her, aware of the differences. Her body was longer than Audra's and fuller at the breast and hip, but it was a welcome body. Audra is his wife. Why are you in bed with like one of your childhood friends being like, oh, I'm going to compare like my wife to this girl? Bill is a douchebag. I don't give a shit if he's basically the main character of this book. He cheats on his wife for literally no reason. He's just like, oh, Beverly, she has tits. I'm going to shag her. That's it. Puh. Pathetic. She turned over. He slipped an arm between her side and her arm and cupped one breast gently. She did not have to lie awake, wondering if the hand might suddenly clamp down in a hard pinch. But she didn't snap back this time. She could feel the warm and comforting weight of Bill's arm. His hand cradling her breast. She thought that if she was falling, at least she wasn't falling alone. And he has a good relationship with his wife as well. It's not like Beverly and her abusive husband, because who, li like, literally, who cares? 
if technically she cheated on him. I don't care about that. <clears throat> Audra didn't do nothing. Oh shit, Ben said. I just squashed it. Richie's going to have a bird. He reached for her in the dark. She felt his hand touch one of her breasts, then jerk away as if burned. She groped for him, got hold of his shirt and drew him close. She awoke with a start, sitting bolt upright in bread. The sheet pulled around her waist, her small breasts moving with her quick, agitated breathing. Her chill raced through her and cr she crisscrossed her arms against her naked breasts. She shivered and saw goosebumps ripple their way up her flesh. For a moment, it seemed to her that her voice had... Sp <laughs> give me the bat barge, give me the bat... Give me the bat barge, <laughs> scaredy cat. Ah! Wow, we still have a lot of books to get through. For a moment, it... It doesn't matter. I already said the bit of breasts in. I don't care. Moving on. The bathroom light suddenly went on. She could see it under the door. Then the latch clicked and the jaw juddered open. That's unfair having those words together. Door. J. Door. Juddered. Door. Juddered. Door. Juddered. Door. Juddered. Door. Juddered. Door. Juddered. It's unfair. The door juddered open. She stared at this, eyes widening, arms instinctively crossing over her breasts again. Her heart began to slam against her ribcage. The sour taste of adrenaline flooded her mouth. Maybe it'll be easier for me to read if I just, like, speed read it. Let's try that. And then she closes her arms around Eddie's neck, her smooth cheek against his smooth cheek, and he tentatively touched her small breasts as she sighs. And then for the first time, this is Eddie, and she remembers the day in July. It could have only been last month when no one else turned up in the barrens beside Eddie, and he had a whole afternoon little Lulu comics, and they read together the most of the afternoon. Audra, he said, laughing with her. He helped her off silver, leaned the bike against the handy brick wall, and embraced her. He kissed her forehead, her eyes, her cheeks, her mouth, her neck, her breasts. They're in public. Calm down. Also, you just cheated on her, you swine. The next is the second Dark Tower book, The Drawing of the Three, in which there are six mentions of boobs. The silver tube with the red top, which he had at first taken for some type of canteen, was apparently a weapon. She was holding up between her breasts now. Roland thought that in a moment or two, she would either throw it or spin the red top off and shoot him with it. The beautiful bare-breasted girls, the gunslinger smiled. On the way to the Dark Tower, he said, anything is possible. The gunslinger opens his mouth like a baby for the breast. Can't just be opens his mouth like... Can't be just opens his mouth. Like a baby for the... The rope under her breast was now pulled taut against her... Across her windpipe. The gunslinger's efficient running slipknot was choking her to death. Her face had gone a funny blue colour. She was on the verge of losing consciousness, but still she went on wheezing her nasty laughter. He looked and saw a single star gleaming on the breast of the night. Even space isn't safe from Stephen King. Isn't it beautiful? Why? Just because it looks like a tit? Her hand reached out, groping, and he clasped it. One, the delicious brown of light chocolate. The other, the delicious white of a dove's breast. Next is Misery, which is about a writer who basically gets kidnapped, accidentally kidnapped and held hostage by his biggest fan, who forces him to write a book for her called Misery. Misery's Return. There was only five mentions in this, which I was expecting like more, but okay. Yes, her face shone like a searchlight. Her powerful hands were clasped between her breasts. It'll be a book just for me, Paul. My payment for nursing you back to health. The one and only copy of the newest Misery book. I'll have something no one else in the world has, no matter how much they want it. Think of it. He touched the swell of her breast and felt the strong and steady beat of her heart. She put her arms about his neck, bringing the firmness of her breast more fully into his hand. Hush, my darling, misery whispered, and don't be silly. I'm here, right here. Now kiss me. If I die, I fear it will be with desire for you. So in misery, Stephen King also shows excerpts from Paul's book. So it's a book within a book. It's very meta. But even in the book within a book, there's still mentions of tits. So there's truly no escape. She was dressed in bees, not the bees. From the tips of her toes to the crown of her chestnut hair, she was dressed in bees. She seemed almost to be wearing some strange nun's habit. Strange because it moved and undulated across the rounded swells of her breasts and hips. Annie had dismounted the lawn boy and had been standing frozen, her tented fingers pressed against the peak of her breasts. Now she lunged forward and snatched the cross out of the trooper's back. Next up, we have the Tommy Knockers, which has 18 mentions. I guess this is what inadvertently inspired me to make this video because I was rereading the Tommy Knockers recently and, you know, couldn't unsee the mentions of boobs. I like the Tommy Knockers. It's a very long book, though. It does have pacing issues. Stephen King himself, I think, said that you could take at least like 400 pages off of the Tommy Knockers and you'd still have the same story. 
Um, there's a lot of me. I like it, but if people wanted an intro to King, I wouldn't suggest that one. I just like it because it's about aliens. It's about a woman who uncovers a UFO and continues digging around it because the UFO is massive, but the UFO presence makes the townspeople go crazy and sort of morph into aliens themselves. Anderson thanked her and hung up. She looked at the phone thoughtfully, calling up Muriel fully in her mind, another Irish Colleen. Colleen, I don't know. But Muriel had the expected red hair, just now reaching the far edge of her prime, round-faced, green-eyed, full-breasted. Had she slept with Jim? Probably. <laughs> Patricia McArdle was the New England Poetry Caravan's principal contributor and head ramrod. Her legs were long but skinny, her nose aristocratic but too blade-like to be considered attractive. Guard had once tried to imagine kissing her and had been horrified by the image which had risen unbidden into his mind. Her nose not just sliding up his cheek but slicing it open like a razor blade. Are you all right, Guard? She had a high forehead, non-existent breasts and eyes as grey as a glacier on a cloudy day. I like that bit. Not the non-existent breast part. I've had that too much already. She traced her ancestry back to the Mayflower. Oh, ho, ho. What a Tory. He saw Roy Cummings and goings. No. Standing in the library door, a monstrous drink in one hand, his arm round a pretty blonde girl, his hand pressed firmly against the side swell of her breast. The world's oldest toothbrush, its eroded bristles dark with the grease it had been employed to coax out of some clotted gear or cog tooth, chittered along the dashboard, passing an old air freshener of a naked woman with very large breasts on its way. Fine, I'm fine, Bobby repeated, as she fell forward, semi-conscious, into Gardner's arms. She tried to say something else, but only a loose gargle and a little spit came out. Her breasts were small, wasted pads against his forearm. She's lost loads of weight because of the um, ship's effects on her. Gardner didn't know. He didn't like to imagine Bobby here, racing back and forth, working on two different do-it-yourself projects at once, or five or ten. The image was too clear. Bobby with the sleeves of her shirt rolled up and the top three buttons undone, beads of sweat trickling down between her breasts, her hair pulled back in a rough horse tail, eyes burning, face pale except for two hectic patches, one in each cheek, red patches. She caught movement in the mirror and turned round, making no particular effort to cover her wasted breasts. Why should she? Guard, do my teeth look all right to you? Gardner had poked his head in for a moment, had seen Bobby in a much more typical Bobby Anderson sleeping posture, naked except pyjama bottoms, small breasts bare, blankets kicked into disarray between her legs, one hand curled under her cheek, the other by her face, her thumb almost in her mouth. Bobby was okay. Hallelujah, the congregation yelled jubilantly. Breasts heaved, eyes sparkled, tongues slipped out and wetted lips. Joe Paulson considered this for all of 12 seconds before looking back at the Sony TV and losing himself in dreams of Nancy Voss's heaving white breasts. It was getting hard to walk. The air was becoming tough, springy. She could feel it stretching her cheeks, the skin of her forehead. She could feel it flattening her breasts. Her breasts began to ache from the pressure and suddenly her feet began to slip in the dirt. Panic slapped at her. She brought her hands up and touched the hot, leathery body, bones covered with scant flesh. The bat had roosted just above her right breast in the hollow of her shoulder. She suddenly realised that she had called it, that somehow she had called all of them. She could hear its rodentine, scabrous mind, its thoughts dark and instinctual and insane. <laughs> Poor bat, it's just existing. It thought only of blood and bugs and cruising in blind darkness. Kissed, they kissed. Oh, they kissed and now her shirt was unbuttoned and this was not the body of a sex goddess. It was white and sickish, the muscles flabby, the breasts saggy, but he loved it and he kissed her and kissed her and their tears were all over each other's faces. So at this point, Bobby is beginning to morph into one of the Tommy Knocker aliens. The shower had washed off the makeup. Bobby's entire head and neck were transparent and jelly-like. Her breasts had swelled bulbously outward and seemed to be merging into one single nippleless outcropping of flesh. Anne could see dim organs in Bobby's stomach that looked nothing at all like human organs. There was fluid circulating in there, but it looked green. Did you get really drunk? Bobby asked with surprising gentleness. Her face was dark with makeup again, and Bobby had been wearing shirts which seemed oddly loose and baggy in the last few days. This morning he thought he could see why. Her chest was thickening. Her breasts had begun to look like a single unit instead of two separate things. It made Gardner think of guys who pumped iron. Ha! Take that, Jim bros. Take that, Joe Rogan. Bobby hugged him, and when Gardner felt the jelly-like movement of her breasts and torso, he felt sick revulsion rise in him. Starlight? Maybe the stars were touching him right now. 
Sick. I thought I was dying. My heart. She clapped a hand dramatically over one breast. It was beating so fast. My head started to ache and I got a nosebleed and Vera got scared. She says, turn around, Eileen, right now. You've got to get to the hospital right now away. Dark half is next. I've not read this. Don't know what it's about. Six mentions. She stood just outside the living room, looking at the tumbled cushion, listening to the radio. What the climb of three flights of stairs hadn't been able to do that one innocent cushion had. Her heart was beating rapidly onto her massive left breast and her breath was coming shallowly through her mouth. Thad lowered his hand slowly. From the corner of his eye, he could see Liz with her hand clasped into a tight white ball between her breasts. And suddenly he wanted to be furious at this cop who had been freely invited into his home and then refused to shake his hand. This cop, whose salary was paid, at least in some small part, by the taxes the Beaumonts paid on their house in Castle Rock. This cop who had frightened Liz this cop who had frightened him. He cupped one breast through the pink robe and kissed her parted lips. I'll be up just as fast as I can. He snatched her free hand out of the air, brought it down, forced both hands behind her and encircled the wrist with his own hand. It was spongy, but as unyielding as a manacle. He lifted his other hand to the front of her blouse and cupped her breast. Her flesh moaned at his touch. She closed her eyes and tried to pull away. He squeezed her breast harder and she felt the ruthless strength under the decay. What decay? Like an armature of articulated steel rods embedded in soft plastic. How can he be so strong? How can he be so strong when he looks like he's dying? I love all of this out of context. Great. She shrank away from him, reflexively hugging both babies tighter to her breasts. They had quieted down, but at her convulsive hug, both began to whimper and wriggle again. Third book in the Dark Tower series, five mentions. He pointed at them, moving his finger from left to right. There's the one who pinched your breast and laughed. There's the one who said he'd better check and see if you had something stuffed up your ass. Not long after, Roland ceased his babbling. Eddie raised his head and looked over. The gunslinger appeared to be sleeping naturally again. Eddie looked at Susanna and saw that she had also gone to sleep. He lay down beside her, gently kissed the swell of her breast and then closed his eyes. Susanna howled and rocked backward, cords standing out on her neck. The dress she wore first flattened against her breasts and belly, then began to tear itself to shreds. She could hear a pointless, directionless panting, as if the air itself had decided to rut with her. That means do the sex. This time it was she who did the reaching, pressing her palms to his stubbly cheeks, drawing him down, kissing him gently. When he put a light hand on her breast, she sighed and covered it with her own. But when the stranger seized his right hand and shook it, that thought passed like a dream on waking. The scream which had been locked in Quick's breast escaped his lips in a lover's sigh. He stared dumbly up at the grinning newcomer. The loose flap of his scalp swung and dangled. At this point, I should mention a few books. There was one called Cycle of the Werewolf. It seems it's a comic or a graphic novel. Couldn't find it online, so that's not been included in this video. Eyes of the Dragon, 1987. I also couldn't find a version to read. There was another book called The Colorado Kid. I couldn't find an English version, so I've not included that in this book. And in the book, The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, there's no mentions, which is good because it's about a little girl who gets lost in the woods. I liked that book. I definitely recommend that one. Needful Things. Needful Things has 27 <laughs> mentions. It is about this man who opens a shop in I, Castle Rock. Yeah, in Castle Rock. And the shop has your, your heart's most secret want, but at a price. Such thoughts offered Brian a bizarre sort of comfort, but they did not change the fact that Hugh Priest had aborted the daydream just short of its apogee, kissing Miss Ratcliffe and actually touching her right breast while they were in the tunnel of love at the fair. This 11-year-old kid having fantasies about his teacher. Rosalie looked startled. Why? She began, and then her eyes settled on the newcomer with the casino night button pinned adamantly between her breasts. She was studying the Turkish rug hung on the wall with the fixed interest of an art student in a gallery. Her hands were planted on her vast hips. Oh, Rosalie said. Excuse me, I really ought to get along. She sat, staring at him in dumb agony. Large patches of sweat were creeping out from under her arms and along the sides of her breasts. 
Nan Roberts herself came over to wait on them. She was one of William Rose's Baptist Christian soldiers, and today she wore a small yellow button above her left breast. Her memories of herself and her son together in the dark of night, Kelton feeding at one small breast while she read a John Dean MacDonald paperback and the disconnected sirens rose and ray through the cramped hilly streets of the city. Those memories were hers. Hugh held the corkscrew with the note pinned to it over the white bib on Raider's breast. I don't think that one counts. Then he touched her breast and winked. Want to mert or is it too early in the day for you? Raider, she cried. Oh, my little... Oh. Oh, Raider's the dog. Warning, dog death. Raider, she cried. Oh, my little doggy. No, oh, no. She rocked him back and forth against her breast, trying to bring him to life with her warmth, but it seemed she had no warmth to give. She was cold. Cold. I was awake, she said, and put her arms around his neck. He slipped his own about her waist. The deep bed warmth of her pleased him. She was like a sleepy furnace. He felt something hard against his chest for a moment and almost registered that she was wearing something under her cotton nightgown. Then it shifted, tumbling down between her left breast and her armpit on its fine silver chain. How often had she run her finger lovingly over those very same moles? She and Lester sat on the porch swing. How often had she kissed them lovingly as he caressed her breast, armoured in a heavy J.C. Penny bra, carefully selective for just such conflicts of love on the back porch, and panted terms of endearments and promises of unflagging loyalty in her ear. Her breasts rose sharply. A hissy little gasp of dismay tore over her teeth and down her throat. Rosalie went out front to wait on the customer. When she was gone, Polly's left hand went to her chest and touched the small bulge, not much bigger than an acorn that rested under her pink sweater and between her breasts. The Castle Rock's select men and select women shared a single full-time secretary, a young woman with the exotic name of Ariadne St. Clair, she was a happy young woman, not overburdened with intelligence, but tireless and pleasing to look at, because that's what matters. She had large breasts, which rose in soft, steep hills beneath an apparently endless supply of angora sweaters and lovely skin. She also had very bad eyes. Flipping heck. He hurried upstairs as fast as he could, suddenly sure he would find her asleep in his bed. She would open her eyes and sit up, the sheet falling away from her lovely breasts, which he had felt, well, sort of, but never actually seen. She would hold her arms out to him, these lovely, sleepy, cornflower blue eyes. I didn't actually know what cornflower blue meant. I thought when he said this that he was talking about cornfields and like corn on the cobs in fields. Uh, I always thought, what? How, how is that blue? I had to Google it. It's a flower. <laughs> but opening wide, and by the time the clock struck ten, they would be virgins no longer. Rooty toot. Mm -hmm. Sally's low heels clicked and clacked. She was holding a manila envelope in one hand. The name of this envelope, Frank Duet, was turned in against her gently rounded breast. She was holding it in one hand. The name was turned in against her boob. What does that mean? I can imagine if it was like under there and sure, right? She's holding it. The... How has boobs got anything to do with that? I don't get it. I can't imagine it. I can't visualise it. You don't want to go back to the way things were, do you, Polly? Mr Gaunt asked in a silky voice. No, she cried. Her breast was moving up and down rapidly. Her hands began to make frantic washing gestures, one after the other. Her eyes wide, never left his. Please, no. Have you noticed when I stumble over words, I just like to shove them together anyway. Her ACDC application, her ADC application had finally been approved there. But it was the turn down she remembered, of course, the eyes of the men, how they had crawled across her breasts. They were better dressed than the Norville down at the diner. Norville, some bloke, but otherwise, she thought, not really much different. The mouths of the men, how they had pursed in decorous disapproval as they considered the problem of Kelton Chalmers, the bastard offspring of this little trollop, this Janie come lately, who didn't look like a hippie now, oh no, but who would undoubtedly take off her silk blouse and nice pantsuit as soon as she got out of here, not to mention her brassiere, bras and put on a pair of tight bell bottom jeans. Apple bottom jeans with the curve. No, with the fur. Apple bottom jeans with the fur. <laughs> and a tie-dye blouse that would showcase her nipples. Their eyes said all that 
and more. Polly parked her car over the place where a woman named Donna Trenton had once... <gasps> that's... Cujo. Had once made the fatal mistake of parking her Ford Pinto and got out. The Azka swung back and forth between her breasts as she did. The Azka moved between her breasts on its own now. Ooh, spooky, supernatural, pervy jewellery bit. Alan's, she whispered. Her eyes rolled nervously in their sockets and her hands clenched and unclenched nervously between her br- How big does he think the gap between a woman's breasts is? What do you, what do you mean? Or am I being too literal in my thinking? When I think between, I think between. That doesn't indicate between. That's just punching myself in the head to rid myself of this dumb video idea. A nurse, Miss Hendry, according to the small nameplate on her breast, walked up the corridor. That one don't really count, does it? <laughs> Polly rolled restlessly onto her side and the Azka tumbled across the fullness of one breast. She heard something inside scratch delicately at the silver wall of its prison. My eyelid just actually started twitching. Don't touch them. See the pain I go through to make these videos. No one's asking for this. I've only got myself to blame. He says to the other officers, don't even get near him. He stepped over the pool of blood, seized Sonny's jacket by the labels of his coverall and pulled him to his feet. Sonny did not resist, but he clutched the steel case tighter against his breast. Her hair clung to her cheeks in wet snaggles and commas. Her dress still gaped open and droplets of rainwater ran down the pimple-studded swells of her breasts. A terrible wave of pain broke in her hands. Polly moaned and held them against her breasts. As she came in, it turned and scurried towards her, that horrid, clittering sound of its legs beating against the tiles, and she had time to think, it was between my breasts, it was lying against me, it was lying against me all the time. Look, she shouted suddenly and tore open the front of her blouse. Rainwater struck the swells of her breasts and gleamed in the hollow of her throat. Look, I took it off, the charm, it's gone. Now take yours off, Alan. If you're a man, take yours off. Get it out for the lads, Alan. Next up is Gerald's game which has 30 men, 30, 30, three zero mentions of boobs. On one hand, to be fair, she is her and it's about this lady and her husband. They're in their, they, they're like summer cabin and they're about to do a sexy game. Yeah. Where she's handcuffed to the bed. So she's almost fully naked except for wearing some panties. To be fair, she is almost fully naked. To be unfair, Stephen King wrote it, didn't he? He wrote it so he could write, write more about boobs. Anyway, her husband looks like he's about to assault her. So she kicks him. He has a heart attack and dies. Pathetic. From what, beaten by one kick. What a loser. And she needs to escape. Otherwise she'll die. Because she's in this bed alone and no one knows where they are. And then his hand, his soft, short fingered hand, its flesh as pink as that which caked his penis, <laughs> reached out and grasped at her breast and something inside her suddenly pops like an overstrained tendon. She bucked her hips and back sharply upward, flinging his hand off. His hand stole out again, caressed her left breast, then squeezed it painfully. He finished this unpleasant bit of business by pinching her nipple, a thing he had never done before. Yes, eventually, his other hand shot out. This time it was her right breast he pinched. And this time the pinch was so hard it fired off nerves in little white sparkles all the way down from her side to her hip. This sounds horrible. For now, spread those lovely legs, my proud beauty. Oh, a walking ick. That, Jessie decided, was a damn good idea. And she turned her mind back to Nora's 10 count. Four was for her hips, too wide, and five her belly, too thick. <laughs> I have no idea what she's talking about. Six was her breasts, which she thought were her best feature. Gerald, she suspected, was a bit put off by the vague tracings of blue veins beneath their smoothly sloping curves. Oh, don't ever show him the inside of your wrist then, or he'll freak out. Pathetic. The breasts of the gatefold girls in his magazines did not show such hints of the plumbing beneath the magazine girls didn't have tiny hairs growing out of their areole either oh why what do they wax them oh, imagine waxing your nipple stop one is for my toes all in a row two is for my legs lovely and long three is for my sex what right what's right can't be wrong four is my hips curving and sweet five is my stomach where i store what i eat is this positive affirmations is this what people do when they wake up in the morning look at themselves in the mirror you are strong you are beautiful you have toes all in a row your legs are lovely and long you also have a sex what's right can't be 
No offense, of course, to anyone who does the positive affirmations thing. Good for you if it works for you. I couldn't do it because I'm British sarcastic and I hate myself. Not British unless you have a strong sense of self-loathing. She couldn't remember the rest of the rhymes, which was probably a mercy. She had a strong suspicion that Nora had warmed them up herself, probably with an eye towards publication in one of the soft and yearning self-help magazines, which sat on the coffee table in her waiting room, and so went on without them. Six is my breasts. Breasts are the best. Stephen King. Seven's my shoulders. Eight's my neck. Get out, she screamed. Now she sat on her heels with her arms stretched out to either side, looking more like Feyre on the sacrificial jungle altar than ever. Her posture, head up, breasts thrust outward, shoulders thrown so far back they were white with strain at their furthest points, deep triangular hollows of shadow at the base of her neck, was that of an exceptionally hot pin-up in a girly magazine. <laughs> if she lived to be a hundred, she would never forget the calm, pretty blonde girl who had pulled up her sweater to show the old scars or cigarette burns on the undersides of her breasts. After showing them the bottoms of her breasts, the pretty blonde girl had pulled her sweater back and explained that she could say nothing to her parents about what her brother's friends had done to her on the weekend her parents had gone to Montreal because it might mean that what her brother had been doing to her on and off all during that year would come out and her parents would never have believed that. Help me, she said to the empty bedroom. Now that she had remembered the blonde girl with the eerily calm face and voice and the stipple of old circular scars on her otherwise lovely breasts, Jessie could not get her out of her mind, nor the knowledge that it hadn't been all calmness, not at all, but some fundamental disconnection from the terrible thing that had happened to her. I'm sure you don't, so I remember for both of us. How's that for a deal? You kept saying it was the girl with the scars on her breast that had upset you, only her and nothing more, and when I tried to tell you what you said in the kitchen about how you and your father had been alone at your place on Dark Score Lake when the sun went out in 1963, and how he'd done something to you, you told me to shut up. By 1965, she can hardly bear to go swimming there, even on the hottest of days. She knows her mother thinks it's her shape. Jessie began to bud early, as Sally did herself, and at the age of 12, she has most of her woman's figure. But it's not her shape. She's gotten used to that, and knows that she's a long way from being a Playboy pinup in either of her old, faded, Jansen, Jansen tank suits. No, it's not her breasts, not her hips, not her can. It's that smell. Then they do. Mrs. Wirtz, her first grade teacher, starts to laugh. Old Mr. Cobb, their gardener until he retired in 1964, laughs with her. Maddie joins in and Ruth and Olivia of the scarred breasts. What a way to be known. It's like how they talk in kind of like medieval fantasy things like Lord of the Rings or, or Aragon or something. Aragon, the shade slayer, Brom's son, da da da, Olivia of the scarred breasts. Jessie looks down at herself and sees that now she is naked too. Written across her breasts in a shade of lipstick known as Peppermint Yum Yum are three damning words. Daddy's little girl. She had drawn her legs up, but now she let them slip back down and fall open. As she did, a fragment of her dream recurred. Daddy's little girl printed across her breasts in Peppermint Yum Yum lipstick. She turned to him, threw her arms around his neck and covered his cheeks and lips with fierce little kisses. His initial reaction was surprise. His hands jerked backwards and for just a moment they were cupping the tiny nubs of her breasts. That shivery feeling passed through her again. Her father abused her when she was a kid. When she had put the last pin into place, she reached for the bathroom light switch, then paused. The girl looking back at her from the mirror didn't seem like a girl at all, but a teenager. It wasn't the way the sundress accentuated the tiny swellings that wouldn't really be breast for another year or two. It was, and it wasn't the lipstick. And it wasn't her hair, held up in a clumsy but oddly fetching sheet. That. It was all of these things together, a sum greater than its parts because of what? She bit her pink lower lip, brow furrowing a little, remembering the night before, the shiver that had gone through her at his touch, the feel of his hands on her breasts. She could feel that shiver trying to happen again and she refused to let it. There was no sense shivering over stupid stuff you couldn't understand or even thinking about it. It was at this point that she first felt her father's hand on the nub of her right breast. It squeezed gently for a moment, drifted across to the left one, then returned to the right again, as if he was making a size comparison. He was breathing very fast now. The respiration in her ear was like a steam engine and she was again aware of that hard thing pressing against her bottom. She felt a delicate tingle in her breasts again. Pleasure and pain, roast turkey with a nehi glaze and chocolate gravy. What? Yes, he said, but his voice sounded almost like the voice of a stranger. Yes, fine, but don't look around. He shifted. The hand which had been on her breast went somewhere else. The one on her thigh moved further up, pushing the hem of the sundress ahead of it. When she looked up and saw her father standing in the bedroom doorway, her first instinctive gesture had been to cross her arms over her breasts. 
At last she regained her former slumped sitting position against the crossboards, arms outstretched, the small of her back resting on the sweat soaked pillow in its badly wrinkled cotton case. She let her head loll back against the mahogany slats, breathing rapidly, her bare breasts oiled with slit, sweat she couldn't afford to lose. A fresh cramp sank long bitter teeth into her left armpit and she pulled her cracked lips back in a grimace. It was like having your heart poked with the tines of a barbecue fork. Then the muscle just below her breast tightened and the bundle of nerves in her solar plexus seemed to ignite like a pile of dry sticks. This pain was new and it was enormous, far beyond anything she had experienced thus far. She relaxed slowly, panting, her head turned up toward the ceiling. For the moment, at least, the dancing reflections up there didn't torment her. All her concentration was focused on that fiery bundle of nerves between and just below her breasts, waiting to see if the pain was really going to go away or if it would flare up again. I can do it again, too, she thought and closed her eyes. She was back on the improbably huge town common the moment she did. The girl with the big yellow exclamation point sprouting up between her small breasts was looking at her gravely and sweetly. She closed her eyes and immediately the scent of her father's cologne seemed to drift into her nose. That and the smell of his light nervous sweat, the feel of the hard thing against her bottom, his little gasp as she squirmed on his lap trying to get comfortable, feeling his hand as it settled lightly on her breast. She finished her clumsy escape from the bed with her left arm stuck stiffly off in the direction of the post to which it was still tethered and her right arm temporarily trapped between her chest and the side of the bed. She could feel warm blood pumping in onto her skin and running down her breasts. Jessie got her face over to one side and then had to wait in this new agonising position as a cramp of paralysing glassy intensity gripped her back from the nep the b b b from the nep from the nep of her nape, from the nape of her neck to the cleft of her buttocks. The sheet against which her breasts and lacerated hand were pressed was growing soggy with blood. Holding her right arm across her chest and keeping the wound in her inner wrist pressed tightly against the upper slope of the left breast, her left breast, not the, it's not just some random boob that's just there. Jessie made a half turn, placing her bottom against the wall. She held the hand beside her blood smeared left breast for a long moment, trying to nerve herself up enough to do it. So Night Shift, the first collection of short stories. I think it was at this point I realized that I hadn't been doing the short stories. <laughs> it's a collection of short stories and there's only two mentions, thankfully. The scar, she muttered. We went swimming at the university pool on an open night about a month ago. He's got a deep dimpled scar on his shoulder, here. She put her hand just above her left breast. He said, a wave of nausea tried to climb up her throat and she had to wait for it to recede before she could go on. He said he fell on a picket fence when he was a little boy. Ooh. I couldn't believe that my sister and the beaten woman who signed Kitty in a circle at the bottom of her letters was really the same person. My sister was a girl with pigtails, still without breasts. Oh, of course, I'm not even halfway. I'm not even halfway. Remember to go to ayclothing.tmail.com for your Elise Yeezy merchandise line. Make, make sure that you do. feel like a competitive food eater and I've just hit the wall. I feel like Adam Richmond. This collection is called Different Seasons. It has, did I already say this? I, I genuinely don't know. What's going on? 10, 10 mentions. His mother wasn't a bad looking chick for 36, Todd thought. Blonde hair that was streaked ash in a couple of places. Tall, shapely, shapely. <laughs> One time we had a substitute teacher at my school. This is true. And he must've been in his fifties or whatever. He seemed quite old to me. I would've been about 14 at the time. And I remember he, he was doing his intro lesson. He was talking about instruments, guitars and such. And I was cracking up because he was being unironically funny. He didn't mean to be like, he got this guitar, an acoustic guitar put in front of him. And he was like, look, the guitar has a womanly, shapely figure. Like he did that and I couldn't stop laughing. And then he got really pissed that people were laughing. Um, he turned out to be a nonce. I'm not joking. 100% happened. Got convicted and everything. So I'm just saying. What was that even in relation to? I don't remember. Shapely, now dressed in dark red shorts and a sheer blouse of a warm whiskey color. The blouse was casually knotted below her breasts, putting her flat, unlined midriff on show. Ooh. Todd hadn't felt any of the things he was supposed to feel at a time like that. Kissing her lips was like kissing warm but uncooked liver. Oh, he's, Stephen King, he's a very good storyteller, you know. 
I think he's one of the best storytellers we've got. Because I don't know if I've already... I can't remember what I've already said. But you can really just imagine you're like sitting around a campfire and some dude's telling some stories, right? That kind of vibe. But I wouldn't say that... I, I couldn't imagine any of his stories becoming classics. Not that the point of writing stories is for them to become classics. I think he's one of the best storytellers. But writers? I'm not sure. I can imagine Kazuo Ishiguro's work becoming classics in a hundred years time. I made a video about this and then I never put it up because I felt that I was just being a bit wimpy. I read Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro like last month and I've never been so impacted by a bit of fiction. Negative. It's brilliant but negatively. Oh it made me really sad. It was like the start of my shit month because I read that and I was gutted, I was heartbroken. 100% recommend people reading it, but my God, is it, is it, it's dire. It's bleak, it's so tragic. It, it really got me. <laughs> so that made me miserable. And then some stuff in my private life happened that made me really miserable. Like some actual bad stuff happened. I mean, it was just the start of a bloody miserable month. Thanks, Kazuo. I'm joking. I, I wanna get on my podcast so I can be like, thank you for being here. Huge fan of your work. But I have a question. Here are my questions. First of all, how dare you? What prompted this? Oh yeah, kissing warm but uncooked liver. Oh, you could imagine it. Which is what makes him a good storyteller, I think. You can really imagine. You can really feel these things. It's gross. Having her tongue in his mouth only made him wonder what kind of germs she was carrying. And sometimes he thought he could smell her fillings. An unpleasant metallic odour, like chrome. Her breasts were bags of meat. No more. What? What? What do you mean bags of meat? Is, is, is Todd a, a dog? Like an actual canine? He smokes and stares out the window and behind him the girl gets out of bed and comes to him quickly, almost mincing, maybe afraid he will turn around and look at her. She puts a warm hand on his back. Her breasts push against his side. Her belly touches his buttock. Her arms twitch to cover herself and then she remembers that they never do stuff like that in the movies and she drops them to her sides again. Her hair is black and her skin is winter white, the colour of cream. Her breasts are firm, her belly perhaps a little too soft. One flaw to remind, Chico thinks that this isn't the movies. Chico, you know, screw off. Shut up. She steps back, closes her eyes, sits on the bed, leans back, legs spread. He sees all of her. The muscles, the little muscles on... Leg spread just reminded me of pap smear and now I'm having flashbacks. To all whom it applies, go get a smear test done. Just do it, just get out of the way. It's uncomfortable for 20 seconds. Just go get it done. But, oh God, but boy, is it uncomfortable. <laughs> it's uncomfortable for 20 seconds, but boy, what a long 20 seconds it is. The muscles, this is meant to be like sexy and I'm just like, ah. <laughs> I don't know how people give birth. You know, legs spread, something coming out. Oh, I will, I will never, I will never, I would never put myself through that type of pain, body changing, hormone, uncontrol, that, like war being waged on your body. I would never do that for someone who doesn't even exist yet. Don't give a shit. I would never do that. I care way more about me to do that. And cheers to that. That shouldn't even be selfish. I care about me. I can only prove that I exist after all, so. The rest of you lot could all just be a figment of my imagination that I've created to save myself from boredom at being the only existing being in existence. But I find that thought rather sad because it's like, if this all is just a figment of my imagination, I'm more boring and dull than I thought because I would imagine something better than this. I wouldn't have imagined taxes. If I've made all of this up, I've created taxes to be shackled to. Oh. So where were we? The muscles, the little muscles on the inside of her thighs. They're jumping uncontrolled and this suddenly excites him more than the taut cones of her breasts or the mild pink pearl of her. Hmm. Excitement trembles in him, some stupid bozo on a spring. Love may be as divine as the poets say, he thinks, but sex is bozo the clown bouncing around on a spring. How could a woman look at an erect penis without going off into mad gales of laughter? The rainwater running down the window makes rippling patterns on her face, her neck, her breasts. Stretched across the bed, her belly has been pulled tight. She is perfect in her moment. You know we are, she says and kisses him again. But when he cups a breast through her jumper, she pulls away. Don't. My father might see. 
Mrs. Coates drifted past us on an inflatable rubber raft. She was lying on her back dressed in her typical September to June school uniform, a grey two-piece suit with a thick sweater instead of a blouse under the jacket, a flower pinned over one almost non-existent breast. How would you know? She's wearing a thick sweater. I put the book down and touched her breast. Too old for this? She turned the covers back with ladylike decorum and then giggling kicked them onto the floor of her feet. Beat me. I'm not saying that for people to clip. Ellen said, eight to the bar. Oink, oink, I said, and then we were both laughing. What? I have four players this. Who's getting off to pig noises? David Cameron, is that you? In the dream, I opened the door to my consulting room and found Sandra Stansfield there. She was wearing the brown pumps, the smart white linen dress with the brown edging, the slightly out of date... What's that even mean? Cloche hat. <laughs> cloche. I bet it's like cloche or so cloche, cloche. The clotch hat. But the, <laughs> but the hat was between her breasts because she was carrying her head in her arms. The white linen was stayed in the street with gore. Blood jetted from her neck and splattered the ceiling. So there's blood like coming out of her neck like a, a, a tap. Right, just spouting out. Like one of those fire hydrants in New York cartoons and films that always go off that you see, right? Blood spouting out of her neck. The first, but the thing that you notice is the hats between her boobs. Okay, skeleton crew. This is also a collection. 13 mentions. <laughs> Steph sighed and fanned the top of her breasts with the edge of her halter. I doubt if it cooled her off much, but it improved the view a lot. <laughs> a pair of glasses hung from an ornamental chain. The sort, I believe, it is illegal for anyone except middle-aged women to wear on her breast. Would it be illegal and obnoxious if I started eating crisps? Is it going to annoy people? It would probably... I'm a hypocrite. It would probably annoy me if I was watching a video of someone talking about something and then they started eating crisps. One time I watched this video of this person talking about something. Really specific, I know. But they were eating crisps in this really like obnoxious way. I, I can't even explain how it was obnoxious. You just have to trust me. It just was obnoxious. Uh, like like they weren't closing their mouth properly and stuff. And I've, oh, I, misophonia is a real thing that affects millions of Americans every day. It's a real thing. I was filled with such a like white hot rage. And there was a lock on the door. I turned it. In the darkness, she was nothing but a shape. I put my arms out, touched her, pulled her to me. She was trembling. We went down on the floor, first kneeling, kissing, and I cupped one firm breast and I could feel the quick thudding of her heart through the sweatshirt. I thought of Steffi telling Billy not to touch the live wires. What an intrusive thought to have in the middle of that. A count of peas flew across two of the checkout lanes suddenly and struck Mrs. Carmody on the right breast. She staggered backward with a startled squawk. Amanda stood forward. Shut up, she said. Shut up, you miserable buzzard. All right, he said. Ricky and Pat were watching him seriously, his son 12, his daughter 9. He told himself again that Ricky would be deep in the swamp of puberty and his daughter would likely be developing breasts by the time they got back to Earth and again found it difficult to believe. I wonder what short story is that. I wonder if it's the jaunt. For anyone wondering, yes, chilli heatwave Doritos are accidentally vegan. Don't even test me. Snow tomorrow, Rachel said, getting up as Deeky's hand wandered almost absently down to the upper swell of her breast. She went to the window and looked out. What a bummer. Have you ever seen an oil slick pancho? He had put his arm around Laverne's bare shoulders in the same almost absent... There's like a bit of chilli stuck in my throat. Almost absent way that he had touched Rachel's breast earlier that day. He wasn't touching Laverne's breast, not yet anyway, but his hand was close. Randy found he didn't care much one way or another. That black circular patch on the water, he cared about that. Oh yeah, that's the like the thing that's in the water. So she sat down, arms crossed over her breast, hands cupping her elbows, shivering. She looked at Randy, her eyes telling him he could come back, put his arm around her. It was okay now. They sat together, arms wrapped around each other, and something happened, natural, perverse, it happened. He felt himself stiffening. One of his hands found her breast, cupped in damp nylon, and squeezed. She made a sighing noise, and her hand stole to the crotch of his underpants. The beach, oh, do you love, do you love, love. The beach, do you love, love, I love. <laughs> Firm breasts, fragrant with copper tone oil, and if the bottom of the bikini was small enough, you might see some. It didn't. 
It just strutted back and forth, its meaty breast thrown out like some avian general reviewing troops. Every now and then it would look at me with small, nasty black eyes and I would freeze like a stone and count backward from 100 until it began to pace back and forth again. Every time it fluttered its wings, my stomach filled up with ice. I continued to drool. I couldn't help it. I was drooling like a baby. Bob sighed. His wife was waiting dinner. His wife had large floppy breasts and blonde hair that was black at the roots. His wife was partial to Donuts by the Dozen, a product sold at the local giant equal store. When his wife... (laughs) Everything I've learned about American culture has been against my will. (laughs) When his wife came to the garage on Thursday nights for her bingo money, her hair was usually done up in large green rollers under a green chiffon scarf. She wore a suit of Alden's long underwear under her dress. The waist of the drawers came up to just below the limp vestiges of her breasts, the shirt almost down to her knees. Four past midnight has six mentions. Why is my new content on this the main channel just me torturing myself? Why? I thought this would be fun. I thought it would be quicker than the three hour marathons of book reviewing. Why am I doing this to myself? Dina jumped and then cringed away from the sound of Crewneck's voice, pressing her cheek against the side of Laurel Stevenson's breast. She was not crying, not yet anyway, but Laurel felt her chest begin to hitch. Dina fetched one final gasping sob and then just lay with her head pillowed against Laurel's breast. I guess crying won't help her. No. My brain just went, I guess there's no point crying over spilt breast milk. (laughs) No. No. The plane bumped up and down again. Albert leaned over Bethany towards the window. This is the short story of the Langolias. Her breasts pressed softly against his arm as he did, and for the first time in the last five years, that sensation did not immediately drive everything else out of his mind. He stared out the window, desperately looking for a break in the clouds, trying to will a break in the clouds. Laurel looked at the aisle and saw Albert and Bethany kissing. Albert was touching one of the girl's breasts for her t-shirt, lightly, delicately, almost religiously. They turned. Laurel Stevenson, white and haggard, was standing in the cockpit door. She had folded her arms across her breasts as if she was cold and was cupping her elbows in her hands. Ah, I've heard that like 10 times at least so far. Halfway across the living room, Amy took her own spill. One of her feet came down on the discarded issue of EQMM and she fell sprawling on her side, hurting her hip and her right breast. She cried out. Dolores Claiborne, I don't think I've read this one, only has two. Garrett wasn't alone. Dr. John McAuliffe was with him. (laughs) McAuliffe was with him. I'd more or less expected that too, but my heart still sank a little in my breast. Can't just be my heart sank. Are you trying to meet a word count, Mr. King? I already knew I was going to have to come back down here, Andy, but it was only after those men left that I quit kidding myself that I could still pick and choose what I was going to tell a whole pack. I saw I was going to have to make a clean breast of everything. Is that an expression? I don't know. Nightmares and Dreamscapes next has 12 mentions. The bouncing his beach 55, for which he was in hock up to his eyebrows and beyond, took when he landed, convinced him to try the dirt when he took off again. And when he did, he had been delighted to find it as smooth and as firm as a co-ed's breast. Tits on the brain. Gary would like to tell them of the sick room at the Cumberland Memorial Hospital where Dana, Dana Roy lay dying with black snot caked around his nostrils and smelling like a fish left out in the sun. He would like to tell them of the cool blue tiles and of nurses with their hair drawn back in nets, young things for the most part with pretty legs and firm young breasts, and no idea that 1923 was a real year, as real as the pains which haunt the bones of old men. See, I like that. No idea that 1923 was a real year, as real as the... I like that. Why does it just have to be around hmm, breasts? His sex life has been both delineated and delimited by that experience, a seminal experience if ever there was one, but he has never mentioned it, although he has been tempted more than once when in his cups, where he's been drinking, he has hoarded it. And it is of this incident that he is dreaming, penis perfectly erect for the first time in almost nine years, when a small blood vessel in his cerebellum ruptures, forming a clot which kills him quietly, considerately sparing him four weeks or four months of paralysis, the flexible tubes in the arms, the catheter, the noiseless nurses with their hair and nets and their fine high breasts. He dies in his sleep, penis wilting, the dream fading like the after image. I thought for a second it was his penis that killed him. Fading like the afterimage of a television picture tube switched off in the dark room. His cronies will be puzzled, however, if any of them were there to hear the two last words he speaks, gasped out, but still clear enough. And you'll never know unless you read it. 
Hogan looked up at the fat woman behind the counter. She was wearing a t-shirt that said, Nevada is God's country. On top, the words swelling and receding across her enormous breasts and about an acre of jeans on the bottom. Hell with you, Myra said gruffly, and Hogan realised she was close to tears. If you won't get my sweet baby, I will. She stalked past him, almost striking him with one, one boulder-sized breast. Hogan thought it would have knocked the little man flat if it had connected. Then he reached up, gave the tip of her right breast a tweak, not a very friendly one either, and walked away. When she looked back at the jukebox, she saw it had filled up with blood and shadowy floating things that looked suspiciously like human organs. Before he could get it, Clark tramped on the brake again, this time with both feet. Mary's seatbelt locked, biting painfully into the underside of her left breast. For a moment, there was a terrible feeling of pressure inside her, as if her guts were being shoved up into the funnel of her throat by a ruthless hand. The article was accompanied by three photos. One was a still from Night of the Living Dead, showing what appeared to be a bunch of escapees from a loony bin standing outside an isolated farmhouse at night. One was from Macumba Love, showing a blonde whose bikini top appeared to be holding breasts the size of prize-winning... Go, go, them things. I don't know. Fruit things, aren't they? I don't know. You can find them in Fallout New Vegas. I'm so cultured. Rest in peace, she whispered, and an interior voice whispered back that her husband was resting in pieces. And then she began to cry, and her cries turned to hysterical shrieks. And she pulled at her hair and tore at her breasts until they were bloody. And she thought, I am insane. This is what it's like to be insane. It leaped from the floor of a box, and from the box it jumped at Elise, catching the cloth of her shirt in its teeth and dangling there between her breasts, legs kicking. At the moment, I would have welcomed a case, even if it meant some mug was tying candy up at this very moment, and adjusting the rope over her, the firm swell of her breasts with particular care. What are you doing right this minute, you thief? Eating dinner at that petite restaurant you made up? Sleeping beside some gorgeous honey with perfect no sag breasts and murder up the sleeve of her n n negligee? Ha! Words. Can't fool me. Driving down to Malibu of carefree abandon or just kicking back in the old office chair, enjoying your painless, odourless, shitless life. What are you doing? What am I doing? Why am I doing this? The next book is Insomnia. It's about uh, some people that get insomnia and then supernatural shit occurs. Four mentions. I'll be back in this room with her. He had the feeling not of speculation, but of prophecy. And he leaned over and put his head on the white sheet that covered his wife's breast. He did not want to cry again, but he did a little anyway. He slipped his arms around her and hugged her against him, imprisoning her fists between her breasts and his chest, her cries, exclamation marks. She seized him around the neck, her arms like bands of iron, and he felt her breasts push against him hard as he drew in all the breath her lungs would hold. Shh, honey, Helen said, and buried Nat's head against her breast again. There were no men, little or otherwise, near Lois Roberts. She was kneeling alone in the street next to the man who had saved her daughter's life. The next story is Rose Madder, which is about a woman who escapes... A abusive marriage, then a magical Greek painting helps her out. <laughs> 33 mentions. This story contains abuse. So viewer discretion is advised. Sometimes when she was lying in bed at night, images would come swarming into her mind like strange comets. The most common was her husband's fist with blood grimed into the knuckles and smeared across the raised gold of his police academy ring. There had been mornings when she had seen the words on that ring, service, loyalty, community, stamped into the flesh of her stomach or printed onto one of her breasts. This often made her think of the blue FDA stamp you saw on roasts of pork or cuts of steak. The cabbie was a fat man with unkept hair, bloodshot eyes, bad breath. His baggy faded t-shirt showed a map of South Vietnam. When I die, I'll go to heaven because I serve my time in hell. Bloody hell. The words beneath the map read, Iron Triangle 16, 1969. His beady red eyes scanned her quickly, passing from her lips to her breast to her hips before appearing to lose interest. Oof, I'd say. And perhaps he had, but that had been 14 years ago. And the girl he'd loved had possessed clear eyes and high breasts and a flat stomach and long, strong thighs. There had been no blood in that girl's urine when she went to the bathroom. Rosie was still barely hearing them. She kept finding new things in the picture to engage her attention. The dark violet cord around the woman's waist, for instance, which matched her robe's trim and the barest hint of a left breast, revealed by ra the raised arm. Every time she moved, the oversized armholes of the shirt disclosed her teacup-sized breasts and small, strawberry-coloured nipples. She was tall, six foot one at least, and big. Her shoulders were wide and soft and dark brown, her breasts the size of melons. What kind of melons are we talking? Watermelons are the biggest. 
Just saying. Unless they're baby watermelons. Anyway. And her belly a large pendulous pod that pooched out her size XXXL t-shirts and hung over the sweatpants she always wore. Okay, Gert told Cynthia, who was once more circling her. Gert bounced slowly. My fringe, like, what is that? What is, why does it curve in like this to my face? All this, I hate it. Gert bounced slowly up and down on her large brown feet. Her breasts rose and subsided like ocean waves beneath the white t-shirt she was wearing. Her breasts rose and subsided like ocean waves. What, from her boobs? Stop. You could tell by the set of her back, by the way her hand was so nonchalantly raised, even, so Rosie really believed, by the shape of that one barely glimpsed breast. As she visualised the blonde hair in its plait, the gold armlet and the barely glimpsed upswell of breast, the flutters in Rosie's stomach quieted. He bit her several times on the breast and face and then he was able to get an erection, she told them. Then, not long before Rosie's miscarriage, Wendy Yarrow had been murdered. She was found behind one of the grain elevators on the west side of the lake. She had been stabbed over 100 times and her breasts had been hacked off. Stop. See how lucky you are, he'd ask, now stroking the back of her neck with his big hard hands, now her shoulders, now the swells of her breast. See how lucky you are to not be out on the street, Rose. Poo, poo, poo. At last she had huddled in the corner with her knees up against her breast and her hands laced over the back of her head and he had been kneeling in front of her, his face serious, almost st studious. And he kept poking her with the pencil and making that noise. It was Harley she was thinking of. Harley who couldn't stop looking at her breasts and always had to check on where the hem of her skirt had finished up when she sat down she hadn't turned but rosie could now see the little tilts and adjustments of her upraised hand as she looked down the hill and the rise and fall of her barely glimpsed left breast as she breathed also her breasts had begun to throb as they had often throbbed in the months following her miscarriage it was just too cold and cold in too many ways she stood shivering and gasping for breath in short little pools of air with her arms crossed tightly over her breasts and little ribbons of steam rising from her skin she touched her left nipple with the tip of her finger and was not much defined it was like touching the, a chip of rock caroline the name she had planned to give her own baby the one norman had beaten out of her came easily and naturally to her mind the fugitive throb in her breasts began again she touched them and winced they were tender she swallowed and heard a dust dry click in her throat. Again, acting with almost no awareness of what she was doing, Rosie ran a hand up her side over the swell of her breast and across her neck, collecting moisture and then licking it out of her palm. This did not slake her first, but only fully awakened it. Well, yeah, how's drinking your own sweat going to help? She heard the bull's hooves go thudding dully along the stone floor, once at a distance, once so close that she stopped short, hands clasped between her breasts as if she waited for it to appear at the head of the passageway she was in. They came fast, bearing down on her, and as they closed in, Rosie screamed and clutched the yowling, frightened baby to her breast and ran for her life. It did no good. The bull was faster. Without realising she was doing it until the infant squirmed and protested in her sleep, Rosie hugged the baby tightly to her breast as she gazed at the birds. Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. The mottled hands lifted the baby against the rose madder gown. The child looked up, smiled, then laid her head on her mother's breast and closed her eyes again. The woman with the sleeping baby against her breast spoke with a queer, flat assurance that chilled Rosie's heart. You shall be divorced of him. She got hold of the clock, felt with her thumb for the stud that shut off the alarm, then paused as something else registered. The breast pressing against her right forearm was naked. This idea made Rosie cross her arms over her breasts and hug herself. Her cheeks were burning, her breasts felt flushed and tender from his gentle touch through her blouse, and she found herself wishing that she hadn't worn a bra. Ooh, scandalous. Norman tore off Cynthia's sleeveless blouse, bearing her teacup-sized breasts. He clamped one hand over her mouth, simultaneously pinning her to the wall and muzzling her. He rubbed his crotch against hers. Norman howled a pain and kicked out both booted feet. One missed completely, but the heel of the other caught high up in the diaphragm, just below her breasts. She ran as she had when she was a girl, before her practical, sensible mother had begun the weighty task of teaching Rose Diana... Di Diana? Diana, what's that? Diana McClendon, what was ladylike and what was not. Running, especially once you were at an age where you had breast bounce in front of you, when you did it, was definitely not. Pfft, get a grip. He turned back to Rose Madder and spoke without allowing his eyes to rise any higher than her breasts. Rosie shudders and hugs her husband to be even tighter. When he cups her left breast in his hand, he marvels at the feel of her heart pounding away so rapidly beneath it. The child, Pamela, is far from grown, but she is old enough to have her own friends, to have developed apple bud breasts. <sighs> 
To have begun her monthly courses, old enough so she and her mother are started to argue about clothes and nights out and nights in and what she may do and whom she may see and for how long. Green Mile, four mentions. <laughs> then Del began, speaking softly but quickly in... I'm just assuming that you will know what Green Mile is. It's very iconic. Softly but quickly in that Cajun, which was as round and soft and sensual as a young woman's breast. A man with a good wife is the luckiest of God's creatures, and one without must be among the most... As... What? Not as miserable as me, surely. I think the only true blessing of their lives that they don't know how poorly they are. I cried and she held my head against her breast, and when my own storm passed, I felt better. A little, anyway. But Coffee, from what I'd seen of him, would have been happy to walk until the sun came up, maybe until it went down again. He looked everywhere, starting, not in fear, but in delight, I'm quite sure, when an owl hooed. It came to me that, while he might be afraid of the dark inside, he wasn't afraid of it out here, not at all. He was caressing the night, rubbing its senses across it the way a man might rub his face against the swells and concavities of a woman's breasts. She was so beautiful, my Janice, and I still dream of her. Old and tired as I am, I dream that she walks into my room in this lonely, forgotten place with the hallways all smell of piss and old boiled cabbage. I dream she's young and beautiful with her blue eyes and her fine high breasts that I couldn't keep my hands off of. And she'll say, why, honey, I wasn't in that bus crash. You made a mistake. That's all. Even now I dream that. And sometimes when I wake up and know it was a dream, I cry. I, who hardly ever cried at all when I was young. Next up is Desperation, which is about this ghost town that's been infiltrated by some bad god he takes over the sheriff and then they take a he takes a family hostage it's pretty graphic i remember reading it when i was 18 and being quite taken with it i thought it was very good 20 mentions in desperation i'd leave she said just pick up my cantaloupes and go he touched her left breast briefly with his right hand that's a nice set of cantaloupes, ma'am. When has that pickup line ever worked? I want to know, Stephen King. One of the things that attracted him to her, although he supposed the fact that she had the best breasts in America back in those days had helped matters along. How had they gotten out here in the first place, among the cast-off tyres and rusty engine parts, standing hip-deep in sunflowers and feeling each other up? He couldn't remember, but he remembered the rich curve of her breasts in his hand and how she'd gripped the belt loops of his jeans when he cried out against her neck hauling him closer so you could come tight and hard against her taut belly. Mr. King, just just write a porno, just do it. He put her about five, six and skinny as a rail, a hundred pounds max, so probably more like 95. She was wearing a tank top with torn off sleeves. This gave an awfully generous view of her breasts for a girl who was worried about meeting Ted Bundy in a rider van. Not that she had a lot to worry about up there. Steve guessed she could still shop in the training bra section at Walmart if she wanted to. Why is Steve being so judgmental? Chill out, dude. She came forward, the doll curled against one mosquito bump breast. Outside, the wind gusted, throwing sand against the RV. It sounded like hard rain. David Carver saw it while the woman in the blue shirt and faded jeans was finally giving up, huddled back against the bars of the drunk tank and holding her forearms protectively against her breasts as the cop pulled the desk away so he could get at her. Mrs. Ross has stopped... Mrs. Ross has stopped... Mrs. Ross has... Mrs. Ross had stopped struggling now. Mr. Ross's hand had ended up locked together just below her breasts. Her head was bent, so her hair hung in her face. The way they looked made David think of the World Wrestling Federation. The Ellen Carver, who had raised two lovely children, had kept her man when those all about her were losing theirs. The one who examined her breasts for lumps once every six weeks or so. The one who liked to curl up in the living room on weekend nights with a cup of hot tea and a few chocolates and paperbacks with titles like Misery in Paradise. My throat is starting to hurt. And here was another disgusting little facet of this experience. He was becoming aroused by Mary Jackson. She was quivering in the circle of his arm. He could feel the softness of her breast just above his hand and he wanted her. Her husband was hung up like a flipping overcoat right up behind them, but he was still getting a fairly respectable stiffy, especially for a man with possible prostate woes. Terry was right all along, he thought. I am an asshole. <laughs> R slash am I the asshole? So me and this family, we were kidnapped by this crazy sheriff and he killed someone's husband and hung him up like the scene in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But you know, his widower is crying on my arm and then I start getting a boner. Am I the asshole? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happens to this book anyway. 
Mary, standing by the screen and looking school teacherly with her arms folded under her breasts. She was crying and holding her arm against her breasts. It was broken. You could see it was. It looked like it had an extra joint in it above the elbow. One of these, as primitive as any cave drawing, showed a horned and misshapen child hanging from a gigantic beast. Beneath it was scrawled a little couplet. Little bitty baby smitty, I seen you bite your mama's titty. Grow up. It was Ellen Carver out there and she didn't look good. She was slumped over her left arm, which she was holding against her breast with her right. What Mary could see of her face was chalky white. He was faintly aware of the others moving in around him as he looked through the pictures, using one finger to spool back through the years. Here was a bearded Johnny and a beautiful dark haired woman with high cheekbones and thrusting breasts. All, all these breasts are always like thrusting out. Why? They need to calm down. Calm your tits has never been so apt. Flip off, she cried and battered it away. She got to her feet, took the flashlight off the top of the dryer, clasped it between her upper left arm and her left breast. She backed away from the dead pile on her knees. The flashlight once more clamped between her arm and her breast. Mary put her hand on the side of his head and urged him wordlessly with it. He came willingly enough, pulling, putting his face against her breast. When did they have the time to have sex? There is a crazy possessed sheriff after them. Possessed by some sort of demon. He curled the bags of anfo protectively against his chest, making breasts of them. When there's nothing around that looks like a breast, just make your own out of some dynamite. They had passed the Carver's RV. David had turned his face against Mary's breast again as they approached it. Maybe that bit wasn't referencing sex. I, d I don't know. Yes, always the truck, except Peter had never ridden the in the truck. And maybe she did want the smell of him a little longer, the feel of him. That's a nice set of cantaloupes, ma'am, he'd said, and then touched her breast. I don't know anymore. The Regulators is a story set in an alternative universe to Desperation, so it features the same cast of characters, but in a different scenario. They're a little town that suddenly gets, again, held hostage by a demon who is possessing a little boy and using his psychic powers or something. Along with the other sounds, he can hear the shower upstairs and he thinks of Marielle naked in there, the bitch of the Western world, but she's kept her body in good shape. He thinks of her soaping her breasts, maybe caressing her nipples with the tips of her fingers in circular motion, making them hard. Yes, of course, of course, men. That's what we're all doing when we're not around you, we're always playing with our boobs. She stood up and Jan, that young Jan, still with both breasts intact, stopped her chatter at once and looked at Audrey with sad eyes. Yes, all right, by Ord, Jan's voice seemed to come from a great distance now and she was fading like a ghost. As the colour went out of her, she began to look more like the woman who was waiting for her to catch up, a woman with one breast and a narrow, often ungenerous point of view. She had almost no insight into the relationship between the host and the parasite, and that made her situation even worse. She thought Steph was a lot more interested in buckaroos than brim breasts. He was only eight after all. His wife was also a good sort, easygoing and equipped with mild sleepy eyes, a good sense of humour, beautiful breasts and not, so far as Steve could tell, an unfaithful bone in her body. There were a lot of people in this room. She made it 11, counting herself, but the numb silence which had settled over them made it seem like less. Ellie Carver was still given an occasional watery gasp, but her face was against her mother's breast and Belinda thought she might actually be asleep. Cammie leapt at her and grabbed her shoulders. It was done before Johnny could even think of moving. Her thumbs sank deeply into the tops of Audrey's breasts. Have noticed something interesting, what may be a key way of deciding which of them is in charge at any given time of the body they share. They both care a great deal for the Cassandra Styles action figure, but Tack, this is the demon that's possessed the little kid, Tack's caring is almost completely sexual. It strikes her plastic breasts, even the demons have tits on the brain, and rubs her plastic legs. Two days ago, I saw it sitting on the stairs and licking the crotch of her blue shorts and sporting an erection. Hard to miss when all it wears most days are underpants. And of course, the fact that it wants me to wear Cassie type clothes and has gotten me to buy, uh, to dye my hair Cassie styles red, horrible shade too, has not escaped me. Get down, mum, Susie calls, but she herself does not stir from beside Dave Reed, who is lying with one arm around her in his hand, the one his creepy mother can't see from where she is, against her breast. At the sound of that voice, Susie forgets all about how nice it is to have Dave Reed touching her breast and how she'd like to help him forget the death of his brother by taking him upstairs and bawling him until his liver explodes. Yeah, that'll do it. A uh, member of your family just like got murdered. Go have some sex. Oh, that saw you right out. Put it down, Cammy screams, but instead of putting Seth down, Audrey lifts him higher against her breast as if in defiance. For some reason, I completely missed this part. I was just pretending it didn't exist or something. 
The slug drives all the way through his brain and exits the far side of his skull, where it enters Audrey's left breast. By then, however, it is too spent to do any further serious damage. The Dark Tower 4. Are you joking? 36. 36. Are you joking me? Don't dare judge me. I'm tired. It's 10 to 12. My throat is hurting. I don't know how cucumber's going to solve that. But it soothes your eyes, right? So maybe it'll soothe my throat. Also, I love cucumber. Susie lying back and looking solemnly up at him, and then smiling and putting her hands behind her head so that her breasts rose, as if aching for his hands. She was too absorbed to look up as Roland strode past her, drawing his gun from the docker's clutch he had built her as he went. He fired a single time. Susanna let out a little scream, dropping her purse and slapping at the empty holster high up under her left breast. One boy, still aching from his battle of the day before and newly educated in the mysteries of sex, one boy, now looking 12 and self 14, his lashes dusting down thick upon his cheeks, the lids shuttering those extraordinary blue eyes. One boy with his hand loosely cupping a whore's breast, his hawk scarred wrist lying tanned upon the ta- counterpane. <laughs> Susan took two reluctant steps forward so that her bare toes were almost touching the old woman's slippers and her bare breasts were almost touching the old woman's dress. She turned. The old woman passed her hands over Susan's breasts, flicked lightly at the nipples with her thumbs, then examined the undersides carefully. She drew back, trembling, her arms and belly and breasts breaking out in goose flesh. I actually read a little bit of this part because I was like, what on earth's going on? And this old lady is, is checking her purity because she's going to be given to this like rich old dude in some sort of medievalish world, you know, to be, I don't know, whatever. To try and like bear him a boy. Not at all, Will. Boys have been stubbing their toes around me ever since I grew my breasts. She now put those palms against the top of her shift and cupped her breasts with her fingers. The nipples were hard, like little pebbles. And when she touched them, the heat between her legs flared suddenly and urgently. It was Susan Dogaldo, of course, shimmering and almost too beautiful to look at in a blue silk dress with a high waist and square cut bodice, which showed the tops of her breasts. This has given me a headache. Susan clasped her aunt's powdered arm. They entered the room side by side, their dresses rustling, the sapphire pendant on the swell of Susan's breast flashing. And many there were who remarked upon how alike they looked and how it pleased poor old Pat Delgado would have been with them. And he, Thorin, not the eld, had taken the opportunity to kiss her mouth and have a quick fumble at her breasts, a part of her that had felt much too naked during the entire interminable evening. I burn for the reaping. (laughs) Instead, here they were, one woman growing toward the end of her courses, thin, disapproving lips and a thin, disapproving face, tiny apple breasts under her high neck dresses with their collar, with their choker collars. The neck, she frequently told Susan, is the first thing to go. Susan ripped the red silk blouse from where it hung and held it up. The shirt moulded itself to her breasts as if it had been longing all the while to touch them. Then why does he send me these whore's clothes? Oh, how ye do lie, she thought mournfully, remembering how Thorin had embraced her in the hall on the night of the party, groping at her breast like a child trying to get his hand into a candy jar, telling her that he burned for her. They were the best kisses of his whole life and never forgotten. The yielding pliancy of her lips and the strong shape of her teeth under them, urgent and not shy in the least. The fragrance of her breath, the sweet line of her body pressed against his. He slipped a hand up to her left breast, squeezed it gently and felt her heart speeding under it. At one point she cried silently in frustration without even being aware of it and pervading her every effort to think clearly and rationally was her desire to kiss him again and to feel his hand cupping her breast. He touched her breasts, also shy to begin with, then slid his palms up to their lower slopes to their tips. He uttered a small moaning sigh directly into her mouth and as he drew her closer and began to trail kisses down her neck, she felt the stone hardness of him below the belt, the, bu- the buckle of his belt. This daydream was so strong that at first Susan responded to the arms which curled around her waist from behind, arching her back as they first caressed her stomach and then rose up to cup her breasts. Not Roland touching her breasts, but Hart Thorin's long and skinny fingers. She looked in the mirror and saw him looming over her left shoulder. 
She had managed at least a degree of diplomacy by simply putting her hands over his and attempting to draw them off her breasts instead of pulling away from him again. He had drawn her tight against him, hands working energetically on her breasts, his respiration a stinky, stinky steam? A stinky steam engine in her ear. They lay that way, hip to hip, looking at the sky. She took his thumb and placed it on her breast. As he stroked the nipple with his thumb, it raised its head, grew hard and began to tingle. This sensation quickly slipped down her body to the place that was still throbbing between her legs. She squeezed her thighs together and was both delighted and dismayed to find that by doing so it only made matters worse. As if hearing her, Susan's eyes opened, but there was nothing in them. They woke and slept at the same time. Rhea saw her gently pull her hand free of the boys. She sat up, bare breasts against bare thighs, and looked around. He saw how tanned her arms were, how white her belly. He saw how Roland's hands cupped the globes of her breasts, squeezing them as she rocked back and forth above him. And he saw how the sun lit her hair, turning it into a fine spun net. Perhaps just a beer or two in the open air would be enough, but the thought of a girl wouldn't quite leave his head. Young, clear-skinned, high-breasted, fresh, sweet breath, fresh, sweet lips. Thank ye, Eldred. Oh, thank ye. And she had hugged him before hurrying in, her tiny breasts pressing like stones against the front of his shirt. Mayhap I'll sleep tonight, after all. Coral Thorin walked down High Street toward the Traveller's Rest, her head thumping rustily and her heart sour in her breast. She had only been up an hour, but her hangover was so miserable it felt like a day already. This feels like I've been doing it for a whole day. He walked back to the bar where Coral stood with her arms folded. Now she unfolded them and took his hands. The right she put on her left breast. The nipple was hard and erect under his fingers. The forefinger of his left hand she put in her mouth and bit down lightly. I know, and I love thee. She kissed his mouth with gentle open lips, put his hand on her breast for a moment, then kissed the warm palm. He held her and she looked past him at the ripening moon. She carried the stuffy from the garden to the pile of leaves on the lawn. She laid it close by the leaves, then scooped some up and pushed them into the bodice of the riding shirt, making rudimentary breasts. That done, she took a match from her pocket and struck it alight. Why? What? She, she's made boobs with leaves. Susan sat up. For a moment, so much input, all of it wrong, crashed in on her that she was incapable of moving. The duvet beneath which she had slept tumbled into her lap, exposing her breasts, and she could do no more than pluck weakly at it with the tips of her fingers. The ball was heavy, and Rhea's strength was fading. After two or three hard shakes, it slipped in her grip. She cradled it against the deflated remains of her breast, trembling. For God's sake, why? They were men, that was all, just more men, and she had been beating such all her life. Oh, they thought they ruled the roost, all right. Nobody in the midworld accused anyone of forgetting the face of his mother. But they were poor things, at bottom, moved to tears by a sad song, utterly undone by the sight of a bare breast. <laughs> and all the more capable of being manipulated, simply because they were so sure they were strong and tough and wise. The vacuere was wearing a heavy serape, if this particular cowboy had the breasts of a woman, they were concealed. The vac wore a large sweat-stained sombrero. If this cowboy had the face of a woman, it was likewise concealed. <sighs> Coral Thorin barked brief, harsh laughter. Reynolds glanced at her, did a double take at her breasts, then looked back at Jonas with an effort. Jonas reached out and caressed one of her breasts briefly. Nice, he said. Nice and tender. No one's a dearborn likes you. Get your filthy blue marked and off of me, you bastard. One more. And I'm going to bed and I'm going to wake up and do this straight away in the morning. Bag of Bones, 20. I haven't read Bag of Bones, don't know what it's about. She leaned over and popped an orange segment into my mouth, her breast warm and provocative against my arm. Place any excuse, I've been cashing your checks. There was something amusing about listening to the grizzled old fart beating his breast. Joe would have kicked her feet and giggled, I'm quite sure. Matty tried to boost Kyra in, but I could see she was struggling. I stepped forward to help her and for just a moment, as I reached past her to grab a plunked leg, the back of my hand brushed her breast. How? She couldn't step back unless she wanted to risk Kyra slivering out of the seat and onto the floor, but I could feel her recording to the touch. Recording to the touch. My husband's dead, not a threat, so the big deal writer thinks it's okay to cop a feel on the hot summer. Oh, I remember... I remember screenshotting this. It was really annoying to read. I thought about a young, pretty girl who had become a mother at 16 or 17 and a widow at 19 or 20. I thought about inadvertently touching her breast. That's all he goes on for the rest of these screenshots. Just goes on about this. And how the world judged men in their 40s who suddenly discovered the fascinating world of young women and their accessories. The Battle of the Titans, dear, Joe said in her cool voice. And all over a teenage girl in the trailer. She didn't even have any breasts to speak of. Hey, some guy snapped bra straps. Did I want to get in his face on this? No, I did not. 
I had saved little Miss Red Socks. I had gotten myself an inadvertent feel of Mum's small but pleasantly firm breast. I had learned that Cairo was Greek for ladylike. Any more than that would be gluttony, by God. I never touched her. Well, there had been that moment when the back of my hand went sliding along the curve of her breast, but that had been inadvertent. Is this what some people are like? They accidentally, inadvertently touch a little bit of side boob and don't you dare ever forget it? Because they're going to go over it in their mental wank bank for the rest of time. Who cares? Why have you mentioned it five times? It's been a long time, Irish. What do you say? Say about what? I called back, although I knew. About this, she put her hands over her breast and squeezed. Water ran out between her fingers and trickled across her knuckles. Everything's all right, Mike, Joe said. She was standing on the float, watching as I swam towards her. She put her hands behind her neck like a calendar model, lifting her breasts more fully into the damp halter. As in the photo, I could see her nipples poking out the cloth. I was swimming in my underpants and with the same huge erection. Everything's all right, Mike, Matty said in the north bedroom, and I opened my eyes. She was sitting beside me on the bed, smooth and naked in the weak glow of the nightlight. Her hair was down, hanging to her shoulders. Her breasts were tiny, the size of teacups, but the nipples were large as said. What does that mean? Because teacups... Whatever. What a strange unit of measurement for someone's jugs. Imagine being like, ooh, her breasts were the size of this uh, drinking mug. Is this like a weird shape, you know? Whatever. On the float, I bent my head and put my mouth on one of Joe's breasts. Oh, fuck's sake. And sucked the cloth-covered nipple into my mouth. I tasted damp fabric. Oh, damp fabric. Oh, the texture of damp fabric. Or... Oh. I eat kiwi fruit with the skin on, but I'm freaking out. Do you know what? I'll show you. Here's one for the nightmares for some of you. I just find it's more efficient. One day I Googled, can kiwi skin, like, is it, can you eat it? Is it edible? It is. There's fiber in it. There's like vitamins and stuff in it. So I thought, because it's such a faff cutting the top off and using like a spoon and then usually like the skin tears and then you can't get enough of the flesh anyway. Such a faff. Just do it this way. Everyone dislikes this. And Dank Lake. She reached for me where I stuck out and I slapped her hand away. If she touched me, I would come at once. I sucked, drinking back the trickles of cotton water. Why am I reading this? Groping my own hands, first caressing her ass, then yanking down the bottom half of her suit. I got off her and she dropped her knees. I did too finally getting rid of my wet, clinging underpants and tossing them on top of her bikini panty. In the north bedroom, I pulled Matty on top of me. What is this book about? Is it just about someone having sex? Oh, my camera's gonna die and I can't be bothered. I'll finish this tomorrow. Okay, good night. I feel like I look like a clown for doing this video and also all of this makeup. Okay, in the north bedroom, I pulled Matty on top of me, relishing the feel of those small breasts against my chest and the length of her entwining legs. Then I rolled her over on the far side of the bed. I felt her hand reaching for me and I slapped it away. If she touched me where she meant to touch me, I would come in an instant. Spread your legs, hurry, I said, and she did. I closed my eyes, shutting out all of her sensory input in favour of this. Hello, it's me from the future. So for whatever reason, and I believe this happens once again during this video, my microphone decided to act up. So here we are. Yet yeah, none of it could quench me. I was on fire. I slipped my hands under her buttocks, lifting her, biting at the sheet. The pattern I saw with no surprise was blue roses. Until I pulled it free of the mattress to keep from biting her on the neck, the shoulders, the breasts, anywhere my teeth could reach. I had a flash of my dream then. The slick, exquisite tightness as I slipped inside her. The little breasts with their hard nipples. Matty walked over, and tonight she looked as I'd half imagined her when I first met her. Like one of those lovely children of privilege you see at the country club, either goofing with their friends or sitting seriously at dinner with their parents' Tories. She was in a white sleeveless dress and low heels, her hair falling loosely around her shoulders, a touch of lipstick on her mouth. Her eyes had a brilliance in them that hadn't been there before. When she hugged me, I could smell her perfume and feel the press of her firm little breasts. I carried Kyra to Scouty and I strapped her in. I remember the first time I'd helped put the kid in her car seat, the inadvertent press of Matty's breast. Get over it, seriously. It's not that much of a big deal, Jesus. Is that a male superpower, being able to remember every time you accidentally touched a boob? Wow. The crowd roared as if it were the funniest thing they'd ever heard, but Kyra began to cry. Sarah saw this and stuck out her breasts, much bigger breasts than Matty's, and shook them at her, laughing her...
Laughing her trademark laugh, laugh as she did. There was a paradic coldness about this gesture and an emptiness too, and sadness. Yet I could feel no compassion for her. I realised I was saying it aloud, whispering it rapidly into her ear as I held her with my hands going up and down her back, my fingertips ridging her spine, touching her shoulder blades, then coming round in the front to cup her small breasts. Forster says, His adolescent voice breaks into this kind of mouth squeak on the last word and she laughs. She knows how unwise that is, but she can't help it. She's never been able to help her laughter any more than she's ever been able to help the way men like this look at her breasts and bottom. Blame it on God. I blame on Stephen King. And it doesn't end. There's come down her throat. Come running down the crack of her ass. The young one has bitten the blood right out of her left breast and it doesn't end. They are young. Ugh. Moving on. Hearts of Atlantis, which has nine mentions. I don't know. But then, I don't know why a man you just met would give you a birthday present in the first place. She sighed, folded her arms under her small, sharp breasts. Why are they, why are they sharp? What do you mean? She's got one of those, like, Madonna bras on. She laughed, delighted. Her bosom heaved. Well, mostly your hair, but also the freckles. And this here ski jump, she bent forward and Bobby could see the tops of smooth white breasts that looked as big as water barrels. She skidded one finger lightly down his nose. Bobby saw her more and more clearly as he settled back against the seat, his eyes taking on that drifty, far-off look Ted's eyes got when he had one of his blank outs. Bobby saw her shoulder-damp puff of blonde hair that sloped her breasts into the towel, her long thighs... Her painted toenails standing over the words adult only must have driver's license or birth certificate. He heard her gasping for breath, saw her trembling, terrified mouth and her torn stockings. Her fancy dress was also torn. One of her breasts was scratched and bleeding. One of her eyes was almost closed. A thread of blood trickled from one of her nostrils. Her left arm lay across her midriff, pulling her shirt tight against the beginning nubs of what would be breasts in another year or two. I love how Stephen King defines the age of his female characters um, in relation to when they're going to get boobs. It continuously happens throughout the rest of this video. I'm so, I'm not happy. I hate repeating myself. I hate repetition. I hate that I just repeated repetition two times just then. This is really annoying. What a terrible microphone. Never get this, what is it, tonal? the heck is that? What's a tone or? Never get this brand of microphone. Anyway, let's just fill in the blanks because there's no way I'm putting on makeup to refilm anything today. Tonight, she was wearing a white silk blouse that showed her shoulders, pretty shoulders, creamy white and as round as breasts. How can shoulders also look like boobs? Does Stephen King think that like you know the Michelin man, you know how that looks, yeah? But just imagine that and every like roll is just a boob. What's going on? And the top of her prodigious bosom, prodigious bosom, bill and Ted, whoa, most prodigious bosom. <laughs> whoa, excellent. On the album cover Skip was holding, a girl with a perky face and perky little breasts <laughs> poking out of the front of a midi blouse appeared to be dancing on the deck of the PT boat. I don't know what that is. One hand was raised, palm out in a perky little wave, cocked in her head was a perky little sailor's hat. Perky, is she? Say that one more time. Carol had pulled the sides of her sweater together, but her bra still hung over the back of the seat, and she looked madly desirable, with her breast trying to tumble out through the gap, and half an areola visible in a dim light. Oh my god, what a whore, half an areola. I'm joking. She had her purse open and was fumbling her cigarettes out with shaky hands. Even if I asked pretty please, she took my hand, slipped it inside her sweater, placed it on her left breast. Well, madam, that certainly is an argument, isn't it? The part of me which had begun to swoon snapped immediately back to attention. Ignore this mess behind me. I'm in the middle of making like peanut butter, truffle, crispy thingamabobs. So but I'm just waiting for them to like chill and set in the fridge. So I figured I might as well do some work in the meantime. Right. Okay, Dreamcatcher, five mentions. Lego my ego, he cries, then laughs. It is the laugh of a man in the grip of a fond recall. The sight of a sunset, the firm feel of a woman's breast for a thin silk shirt. Not that Barry has, in Henry's estimation, ever felt such a thing, or the packed warmth of beach sand. Although her parka was thick and she was wearing God knows how many layers beneath it, it swelled noticeably in front, indicating the sort of prodigious jugs for which breast reduction surgery had been made. The girl's hair fell around her face in big, blowy, far afore set waves, and her gown was strapless, showing the tops of her breasts. 
And he screamed it out as he lay against her breast, making her forget all about what might or might not be happening up in the Jefferson tract, freezing her scalp to her skull and making her skin crawl and ripple. I didn't know what that means, and I looked it up and I've forgotten. But there you go. This is incredibly frustrating that this microphone just cocked out, cocked up. It all went tits up. Can't believe in all of Stephen King's novels, he's never used the term, it all went tits up. It would be the perfect term for him to use. But anyway, can we still appreciate my effort in this video, even if the rest of the video is going to be fractured like this. Please. Undergo horripilation hor in which the hairs stand erect from the body due to cold, fear or excitement. Ah, goosebumps, that is the correct term for it. Very well. See, don't say you don't learn nothing on my channel. She was wringing her hands together, her eyes full of tears, and although she had put on weight at the breast and hip, although her hair was now almost entirely grey, it was her. She was still she, but duddits, oh boy, duddits. The next one is called Black House. Again, this is a story that I've not read, and it has eight mentions. And what had made all that happen? What had been the first cause? Why, a man listening. That was all. Listening to the lady bartender who was used to having her breast stared at while her words most commonly went in one ear of the man doing the staring and out the other. Unaware of what he is saying, he yanks her hard, as hard as he yanked the fishing pole in his dreams and spins her around like a ballerina when she comes up on her toes. Then he seizes her in a bear hug, his wrists brushing the undersides of her breasts, her bottom tight against his crotch. I know I've been saying, like, for a meme, Stephen just, like, writes some erotica, writes some form. I'm actually surprised that he never has. He pops his thumb up between her breasts like a hitchhiker, then says the magic word as he pulls sharply upward and backward. At this point, I try to imagine what... So I don't really understand, is this meant to be a sexy thing? Like, he's spinning off her bra, or is it meant to be a sexual assault type of thing? But... I did note that Stephen King has used the ex these exact words before. He pops his thumb up between her breasts like a hitchhiker. He said it before. You cannot escape me, Stephen King. I know everything because I'm the only person dumb enough to do this. Rebecca raises both hands, closes her eyes and presses her fingertips to her forehead, giving Pete Wexler an excellent opportunity, of which he does not fail to take full advantage, to admire the shape of her breasts underneath her blouse. It may not be as great as the view from the bottom of the ladder, but it'll do all right. Yes, it will. The hem falls to just below her knees. Her legs are bare, but she's wearing a silver anklet on one of them. So slim it's almost invisible. She is fuller breasted than Judy, her hips a bit wider. Sisters, you might think. Many oarsmen, Sophie says, that makes a row in motion that throws her breast into charming relief. She takes his hand and presses it against the underswell of her left breast. He can feel her heart pounding. Is this a joke? He has never been kissed with such intensity in his life before. His hand goes to the breast beneath her nightdress, and he feels the frenzied gallop of her fa If she were to run faster, she'd catch her feet and fall, Jack thinks, beneath its firm rise. At the same moment, her hand slips inside his shirt, which has somehow come unbuttoned, and tweaks his nipple. It's as hard and hot as the slap. Another short stories collection. This one is called Everything's Eventual, and there are 12 mentions. <laughs> Roland believed this one might be a woman with the dangling vestiges of breasts beneath the vest it wore. The one in the red vest was female. Her bare breasts swinging beneath the dirty red vest were the last things he saw clearly as they gathered around and above him, bashing away with their clubs. A six a sixth sister appeared, pushing rudely in between Mary and Tamara. This one perhaps was only... T one in 20. This is honestly the worst video that I've ever done. I know I'm just complaining at this point, but it took six hours to record this and then to find that for the last hour and a half. I mean, there's been so many audio issues anyway with the microphone and try there's just been a lot going on. But then to find in the last hour and a half of the recording itself, it's just interspersed with these... Maybe I should leave a bit in to show you guys where suddenly I'll be like, this one... <laughs> so anyway, with flushed cheeks, smooth skin and dark eyes, her white habit billowed like a dream. The red rose over her breast stood out like a curse. She coloured more definitely at that, roses more natural and lively than the one on her breast mounting in her cheeks. Ooh, Sister Corquina said, raising her eyebrows. We like her, do we? She makes her heart go. She put her hand against the rose on her breast and fluttered it rapidly. When I got back, Rosalind was in bed with a book in her hands and the covers pulled up to her breast. 
Old men trying to look young in red vests and black string ties. Or maybe she's blowing GM cowboys in Austin or Wendover, bending forward until her breasts press flat on her thighs, beneath a calendar showing tulips in Holland, gripping set after set of flabby buttocks in her hands and thinking about what to watch on TV that night when her shift is done. I grabbed Diana's wrist and yanked her to her feet. She came without a word, took a step towards me, then stumbled on her high heels and fell clumsily into my arms. I was aware of her breasts pushing against me and the wet, warm clamminess over them. An idea struck me then, a way of explaining without explaining, and I put my hand over Diane's left breast for a moment on the cloth, on the soaked cloth of her dress. He jabbed, I rolled, but this time he didn't pull back as far, and I realised he was nerving himself up. He meant to go for it, and soon. I could feel Diane's breast brush against my back as she gasped for breath. I'd given her room, but she hadn't turned around to work the bolt she was just standing there. I'm assuming they're like in a fight or something. Still has enough time to notice someone's boobs against his back. At Our Lady of Angels Grandma at Middle School, she had worn it, and then at St. Vincent de Paul High. She wore the medal until breasts grew around it like ordinary miracles, and then someplace, probably on a class trip to Hampton Beast, Beach, she had lost it. Coming home on the bus, she had tongue kissed for the first time. Butch Sousey had been the boy, and she had been able to taste the cotton candy he'd eaten. The lady on the stairs had pulled down the top of her gown, bearing her breast, breasts. She held one in each hand. A drop of blood hung from each nipple. Stop. She was staring directly into Mike's eyes and grinning ferociously. Her teeth were filed to cannibal points. From a book, B-U-I-C-K. I don't know what that is. From a biuk, <laughs> biuk, biuk. Like goofy. Yuck, yuck. Hey, Sora. Yuck, 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 yuck. Anyway, one mention, that's all. And I saw it, a shadow against the shed's white painted side. Then it shifted and the shadow's owner came forward and I could see the curve of a woman's breast and hip in the dim light. If you were disappointed that the last one only had one mention, well, the next book is The Dark Tower 5, the fifth book in the Dark Tower series. 25 mentions. <laughs> Why did I think this was a good idea? Of course she did. Tian's sister, six and a half feet tall, now standing with the straps of her overalls lowered and her big breasts sparkling with water as she splashed them from a rain barrel. A strapping young man watching a strapping young woman with her breasts out on show like that might have well have been a sporting a bulge in his pants, but there was none in Zally's, nor ever would be. He was runt. What's that? The eunuch? I don't know. She wiped her greasy fingers on her bosom, doing it slowly, enjoying the way the stains of the mixed meat and juices spread on the expensive silk. Enjoying the ripening curves of her breath. Ripening curves, what you... We aren't carrying around bags of fruit on our chests, guys. And the feel of her nipples under her fingertips, rough and hard, excited. He watched her reach over the empty plates that weren't there and empty glasses also not there, eating directly from the serving platters, chewing everything with the same hungry relish, her face gradually picking up the shine of grease, the bodice of her gown, which he did not see but sensed, darkening as she wiped her fingers there again and again, squeezing the cloth, matting it against her breasts. When she turned, Roland had by this time stepped behind a tree and become one of the shadows. He could clearly see the way her breasts had ripened. Honest, Susanna said at once, and then gave another little wince and rubbed beneath her left breast. Her hand went back to the place below her breast. This gas! My! What I wouldn't for a roll of tums! He handed them down to Susanna, who took them and strapped them on the belt high at the waist. The cloth of her shirt pulled tight when she did, and for a moment Eddie thought her breasts looked bigger. Then he dismissed it as a trick of the light. Susanna rolled up to them. Her eyes were huge, her smile amazed. She clasped her hands tightly between her breasts. Oh, Eddie, she breathed. Did you know he could do this? Did you have the any slightest idea? I'm still holding out for Audible to ask me to be one of their narrators. Eddie turned to her. Imagine me trying to like narrate a book. It would take years. Slipped her hand. Case in point, immediate case in point. Slipped his hand beneath her arm so he could cup her breast. His last thought was for Jake. He kissed her and willingly, but couldn't help marking how much longer, larger, not longer, like breast getting, breast getting really long like every time she tells a lie, like some big boobed Pinocchio. Her breasts were as they pressed against him. Roland considered the question. As he was doing so, Margaret Eisenhart joined them. She was a slim woman, 40-ish, small-breasted. What a bitch. Dressed in jeans and a shirt of grey silk. At this, Grey Dick was... What an unfortunate name. Was overcome with lust. 
And for Lady Aritza was fair. It excited him to think of his prick getting hard at the sight of her bare breasts and bush and no breeches on him to conceal his excitement from her maiden's eye. She could feel the weight of his eyes on her breasts. It was like having unpleasant bugs lumbering to and fro on her skin. Have it as you like, she said. Roland saw that she was actually pleased, that she wanted an audience and his hope grew. He thought it increasingly likely that this pretty middle-aged wife with her small breasts and salt and pepper hair had a hunter's heart. Not a gunslinger's heart, but at this point he would settle for a few hunters, a few killers, male or female. The female, sweaty and laughing, had to be 6'6", with breasts that looked twice as big as Eddie's head. No, Roland said, she doesn't. Her breasts are a trifle fuller, perhaps her hips as well, but those are the only signs, and so I have some reason to hope. Callahan nodded. It was like looking at Rowan, only with long blonde hair and breasts, his twin sister. The kind of woman, say pardon, Susan. If you're a man, you can always believe that if you're allowed to touch her breast, you'd live forever. What? What is this veneration of women, but only through their chesticles? For a moment, Susanna only remained where she was, about 60 yards from the barn. Her hands lay between her breasts, the right covering the left. She raised her head, looked at the shape chalked on the barn wall. Still her hands lay between her breasts. Thank goodness we got that update. No, and the jittery feelings I used to get just after sunset, just before dawn, have quit. And look at me, she ran a hand down the swell of her breast to her waist from to her right hip. I've lost some of the fullness. Roland, I've read that sometimes animals in the wild, carnivores like wildcats, herbivores like deer and rabbits, reabsorb their babies if the conditions to have them are adverse. You don't suppose? She trailed off, looking at him hopefully. Jake saw everything with a gunslinger's cold, clear vision. The blood splashed on the rock, the clump of hair stuck in it, the foot in the hole, the spittle on Frank Tavery's lips, the swell of his sister's new breast as she lay awkwardly across from him. The walls were coming now. They weren't the only thing. Eddie each had one of the big revolvers with the sandalwood grips. Jake had his father's Ruger. Margaret, Rosa and Zalia each held a Ritza. Susanna had two, her arms crossed over her breasts as though she was cold. Ass Whitler, the great sage and eminent junkie would have said. And Eddie had carved his beloved, a beautiful ring of willow green, light as foam but strong. This Susanna had wore between her breasts, hung on a length of raw hide. Dark Tower 6 with nine mentions. <laughs> The apparition pointed at her. You want to get out of here now, she said. And if you rouse any constabulary... <laughs> Constable... Constabulary... Constabulary... Constables... If you tell the police or raise any posse, I'll find you and cut your breasts off. Find you and cut your breasts off. And an edge like the one she was looking at will probably do the job. Zip, zoop, instant mastectomy. I thought it was mastectomy. Mastectomy. Oh dear Lord. She had hung it around her neck, liking the way it felt between her breasts. And now here was this unknown woman, this bitch trying to take it off. Susanna fought furiously, holding the turtle in front of her breasts where her new friend couldn't see it very well. Beneath the serape, her breasts heaved and Susanna saw her belly curved. Who else should have the keeping of perhaps the most important child to ever be born, including Christ, including Buddha, including the Prophet Muhammad? To who else's breast, if I may be crude, would we trust his suck? Why does it have to be in these terms? Stop. Mia paused a moment longer, fingertips rubbing the rough weave of the shirt above the worst of the bloodstains, which is over her left breast, over her heart. Turn it inside out. With a final eye-watering burst of laughter, the birdie woman left the bathroom. Mia pulled the shirt off over her head, bearing Susanna's breast, which with the colour of coffee, with just the smallest splash of milk added in. Her nipples, which had always been small as berries, were now much larger. Larger, not lava, not little larvae's on her nipples. Nipples craving a mouth. As small as berries. Well, you can get like, you know, blueberries this big, but then you can get strawberries this big. So which is it, King? As small as big honking strawberries. Susanna understood the deal and still had trouble swallowing it. This creature had given up immortality for morning sickness, swollen achy breasts, and in the last six weeks of her carry, the need to pee approximately every 15 minutes. And wait, folks, there's more. Two and a half years of changing diapers, soaked with piss and loaded with shit, of getting up in the night as the kid howls with the pain of cutting his first tooth. And cheer up, mum, only 31 to go. That first magic spit up. That first heartwarming spray of urine across the bridge of your nose when the kids let's go as you're changing his clout. Adopt. Don't shop. This is an advert for contraception. The Dark Tower 7 with 14 mentions. <laughs> no, you daren't. 
Tarana cried as she reached for the gun. The front of her gown finally burst, spilling her massive breasts free. They were covered with coarse fur. She kissed his knees and then each tiny foot. Susanna heard that room's first suckle, not the baby at his mother's breast, but Mia's mouth on each perfectly shaped toe. Never in your life, Mia cried, laughing, but she lowered the child to her chest and impatiently brushed aside the bodice of the plain white gown she wore, bearing her right breast. Susanna could see why men would be taken by her. Even now that breast was a perfect coral-tipped globe that seemed more fit for a man's hand and a man's lust than a baby's nourishment. Oh, that's just male propaganda. Mia lowered the chap to it. For a moment he rooted as comically as he goggled at her, his face striking the nipple and then seeming to bounce off. When he came down again, however, the pink rose of his mouth closed on the erect pink bud of her breast and began to suck. At the same time, its body began to shrivel, its legs pulling up and melting into its belly, its head sliding down and pulling Mia's breast with it into its neck, which puffed up like the throat of a toad. Its blue eyes turned to tar, then back to blue again. What? Mia asked and started to stand up on her elbows once again. Blood had begun to pour from her breast. The baby drank it like milk, losing not a drop. See? Well, if you have a baby and it's like Rosemary's baby, it's a little demon and it does this to you and it sucks all the blood out your boobs. Not having it, no thank you. Then her smile returns, that angelic Madonna smile. She reached out and stroked the still changing freak at her breast, the black spider of the tiny human head and the red mark on its bristly gut. It squealed with triumph. And if it had at that moment chosen to attack the other woman who had given it nurture, Susanna Dean would surely have died next to Mia. Instead, it returned to the deflated sack of breasts from which it had taken its first suck and tore it off. The sound of its chewing was wet and loose. For now, he cupped her breast, the left one, so he could feel the strong, steady beat of her heart and then stopped her speech with his mouth. That's for good luck, she said. And when she saw his look of amazement and understood the power of what she had done, her timid, t- b- 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 her timid titty lessened. She put her arms around his neck, still holding her scuffed poo bear in one hand. He felt it soft against his back and did it again. He felt the push of her tiny hard breasts and will remember this sensation for the rest of his life. Will remember her for the rest of his life. Even if you are tempted by her eyes and breasts, even then, King agreed. I think this is Stephen King's self-insert and of course his self-insert is talking about bloody boobs. She took off her own outer clothes, hesitated, then took off her bra as well. Her breasts hung down and there was a dented scar of her own on one from a lumpectomy instead of a bullet. And so what? She never would have been a Victoria's Secret model, even in her prime. And even in her prime, she'd never mistaken herself for tits and ass attached to a life support system, nor had ever let anyone else, including her husband, make the same mistake. He clasped her left breast and ran his thumb into the hollow of the scar left by the lumpectomy. What's this? Oh, she said in a small voice, good. His hand on her breast, his breath on her neck. After some endless time that might have been an hour or only five minutes, his breathing lengthened and she knew he had gone to sleep. She was pleased and disappointed. Susanna sat as close to it as she could, turning at regular intervals in order to toast both sides equally, relishing the sweat that popped out first on her face and her breast and then on her back. She had forgotten what it was to be warm and went on feeding wood to the flames until the campfire was a roaring bonfire. Next is Cell. I never finished this one. It's about, uh, I think everyone's mobile phones stopped working. You know in Family Guy, when there's that bit of, oh, Stephen King, what's your your next book about? We need a new book. And he's like, what about this lamp that's haunted? Woo! That's what it feels like, right? What if everyone's phones stop working? But it's probably decent anyway. Her friend, Pixie Dark, was backing away from the whole deal, small white hands clasped between her breasts, eyes wide. The migration, once you'd seen it that way, it was hard to think of it as anything else. Thinned, but didn't stop. Even after half an hour, three men would pass walking abreast. <laughs> How'd you walk abreast? What are you talking? I know what it means, but still. One in a bowling shirt, one with the remains of a suit, and one with his lower face mostly obliterated in a cake of dried gore. And then two men and a woman walking in a half ass conga line. And then a middle-aged woman who looked like a librarian, if you ignored one bare breast wagging in the wind that was. What, wagging like a dog's tail, just going like this? What are you talking about? walking in tandem with a half-grown gawky girl who might have been a library aide. When he woke her, she looked at him groggily and clasped it to the breast of her sweatshirt, afraid he would try to take it away again. Check her out, right there. Tom interrupted, pointing to a middle-aged woman who was staggering up Highway 62 with a radio CD player the size of a living room hassock cradled in her arms. She held it against her breast as though it were a sleeping toddler. She stepped forward before Clay could stop her, dropping one of the automatic pistols and grabbing the thing she had seen. It was the sneaker. She cradled it between her breasts. Women can't carry anything. They can't carry things like at their sides 
or just just in front of them. It's not a thing. It's always near or around the breasts. Little known fact for anyone out there who didn't know that. It was the blouse he recognised first, the high-necked white silk blouse that he had always called Sharon's doctor shirt. In some ways, he thought it was the sexiest garment she owned, partly because of that high prim neck. He liked her bare, but he liked to touch and squeeze her breasts through that high-necked white silk blouse even more. He liked to bring her nipples up until he could see them poking the cloth. Next is Lizzie's story, told from a female perspective, I, I assume. 42. 42 inches of boobs. She considered the idea for a moment, then burst out into gales of merry laughter, clapping her hands on the flat part of her chest just above her breasts. Scott, after all, wasn't here to put his arm around her, to kiss her cheek, to distract her by gently tweaking the tip of one breast and telling her that to everything there was a season, a time to sow, a time to reap, a time to strap, and likewise one to unstrap, yea, verily. The dusky yellow light which rains on them from the kitchen puts a deep curved shadow between her breasts. Will you take it? Maybe impossible. She settles for pressing her breasts to his back and her stomach to his naked bottom. Before I continue, viewer discretion is advised because this book details some pretty horrific abuse, especially to a certain part of the woman's anatomy. Bet none of you can guess which part it is. Amanda was turned away from her and Lizzie was still fitted against her like a spoon, her breasts against Manda's back, her belly against Manda's scant bottom, and just what has wakened her. She doesn't need to pee, not badly, anyway. So what? She stepped away from the car, holding the shaft of the spade diagonally across her breasts. She says nothing to this. His hand slips around her neck. At some point it steals inside her unzipped parka to cup her breast. Not out of lust, she's quite sure, for comfort. Mrs. I'm sorry as hell to do this, but at least ain't your pussy, he said, and she had time to register two things before he swept his left hand down the front of her, tearing open her blouse, popping the catch at the front of her bra so that her small breast tumbled free. The first was that he wasn't sorry a bit. This line kept going through Lizzie's head as she crawled through the memory nook, and then slowly across the centre space of her dead husband's long and rambling office, leaving an ugly trail behind her, splotches of blood from her nose, mouth and mutilated breast. There was insanity in this story, all right, but the only sound she remembered just lately wasn't whirring or purring or shirring. Yes. So this one, some bloke in a very graphic way in a minute, mutilates this woman's breast. My guy has breasts on the brain so much that he really wrote a book in which like one of the focal points is a woman's breast gets mutilated just so he could shoehorn in tits as much as possible. I don't hate the grind. It was the sound of her screams when Jim Dooley had attached her can opener to her left breast like a mechanical leech. Hush yourself, she croaked, her outraged breast throbbed and burned. I did remember, her mind whispered to her mind, as she lay looking up at the skylight with the yellow knitted square turning red against her breast. Lying on her back in her dead husband's study, still holding the bloody delight against her breast, Lizzie said, blah, blah, blah. And although she is more frightened than ever, even more frightened than on the night when he came out the dark with his hand in bloody ruins, she frees an arm long enough to turn out the bedside light, brushing his face with the breast that will lately suffer Jim Dooley's madness. The pain of her lacerated breast flooded back in with the light. Alston had to take her to no sofa with the flashes and the siren going. She needed stitches in her breast, a lot of them. She needed protection. She needed it around the clock whose left breast was throbbing like a, well, there really was no accurate simile. It was just throbbing. I mean, you are the writer, so I'll trust you with that. Lizzie lay where she was a moment longer, gathering herself, then rose to a sitting position. Dooley had sliced diagonally across her breast and up towards the hollow of her armpit. Oh, I, could, I could just felt that then. By the time she had got to the back stoop, the deep laceration in her breast was pounding again. She was sweating profusely again. The sweat ran into the laceration across her breast and soon there was a maddening salt sting on top of the deeper ache. She let the tatters of her blouse slip to the bathroom floor and with a grimace of anticipation applied the tea-soaked washcloth to her breast. Lizzie wrung the blood and tea out of the washcloth, dipped it again, replaced it on a wounded breast but this time the sting was less. But it's no cure. I wish it was the end, Lizzie said and lay back with the washcloth still on her breast. The pain was funneling away, but that was just Amanda's Vicodin. She laid the yellow delight square, blood crusted but comforting, back on her breast. A shudder rolled through her. It hurt her lacerated breast in spite of the Vicodin she had on board, but there was no way to stop that shudder until it has run its course. She didn't want to think about that sadness, nor did she want to think about her hurt breast where the pain had begun to creep back. 
She was topless. Her badly gored left breast was starting to throb again and God only knew what kind of things the smell of her blood might attract. Oh well, it was too late to worry about that now. Somewhere up ahead, that bell tinkled again. Barefoot, bare-breasted, blood smeared, baking in the kitchen. Wearing nothing but a pair of old denim shorts and carrying a spade with a silver scoop in her right hand, Lizzie set off toward the sound along the rapidly darkening path. Heart pounding so hard it hurt her mutilated breast. Yes, Lizzie whispered. Her breast was hurting badly again, but she looked at the poor remembered Scott's sliced up hand. Lizzie fought the fear down. She had come a long way, not just once, but twice. Her breast hurt like hell and by God, she would get what she'd come for. She took in a deep breath and then, not knowing what to expect, lowered herself slowly to her knees on the sandy bottom, letting the water cover her breast, the one that was unhurt and the one that was badly wounded. For a moment, her left breast hurt more than ever. She thought the pain would tear the top of her head off. Squat knows too. The arm around her, just below her breast, tightens a bit more. Her breast still hurt, but the fierce throbbing was down to a dull ache. She had felt worse as a teenager, after spending a long hot day in a bra that was too small for her. It was a shock. Yet at the same time, and although there was still some pain in her damaged breast, the breast Dooley had operated on with such a lunatic absorption was marked with an ugly scarlet ditch that circled up from beneath her armpit before petering out to above her rib ribcage. It looked like a fairly bad cut that might have happened two or three weeks ago and was now healing. A quick rinse was all she had time for and her breast was still sore enough to make her decide against a bra. Before she got out of her car, Lizzie touched her left breast lightly of her right hand, wincing in advance at the bright lance of pain she expected. All she felt was a faint throb. Amazing, she thought. It's like touching a weak old bruise. Mrs. Landon, yes, of course. It's the nurse with Bugs Bunny on one breast and Elmer Fudd pointing a shotgun at him from the other while Daffy Duck looks up from a valley below. She touched her wounded breast and felt almost no pain. This is taking self-healing to a new level, she thought and smiled. So many shut books, sleeping deep, they drew the eye. She looked a moment longer, thinking there had once been a young woman named Lizzie de Busher. <laughs> Grow up, with a young woman's high, firm breasts. Lonely? Heart pounding hard and slow in her breast. Next book is Blaze. I don't know what this is about, but it has eight mentions. He ain't got nothing, does he? Mrs. Bowie asked. Her voice was high and reedy. It sounded strange coming from that mammoth breast, which rose under her plaid coat like a comber at Higgins Beach. The girl he had fallen in love with was a seventh grader at Cumberland A School named Marjorie Thurlow. She had yellow eyes and... No, she didn't. She had yellow hair and blue eyes and no breasts. She had a sweet smile that made the corner of her eyes turn up. Blaze turned around and looked at them. Who calls their kid Blaze? Blaze the Hedgehog. The woman was uncovered to the waist. The top of her nightgown had pulled to the side and one breast was exposed. Blaze looked at it, fascinated by the rise and fall, by the way the nipple had peaked in the brief draught. Blaze reached the door, turned the knob and paused to look back. She had flung one arm across her bared breast, hiding it. Her husband was sleeping on his back with his mouth open and for a moment before he snorted thickly and wrinkled his nose, he looked dead. On one of their trips, they saw a vampire movie called Second Coming. John Cheldsman's version of this classic ended with Count Igor Yorga ripping the head from a half-clad young lovely with quaking breasts the size of watermelons. The boys from HH and the Bullbusters from South Portland kept walking, as if they were around girls. Girls with breasts every damn day. Every time he glanced that way, his eyes fell on the jut of her breasts. He tried to do something about this and couldn't. They were just there, taking up space in the world. Yeah, oh, how dare we? How dare we have two balls on our chest that are just there existing? I know. And he found himself staring at a triangular patch of shadow between the two rounded rocks that bulged towards each other like breasts. Give it a rest. Give it a breast, mate. Just After Sunset, a short story collection with 10 mentions. She winked and leaned towards him. Her breast pressed against his upper arm as she kissed his cheek and the sensation was lovely. Surely the living of... Surely the feel of living flesh. Yeah, yeah, the girls always go back by boat. That's all he knows. That's all he knows in the world. Are people ever nosy? Where's your car? Answer me now or you get the new special. A breast amputation. Quick but not painless. What? Edgelord. Her torso was bound to the back by more duct tape, thick corsets of the stuff at the waist and just below her breasts. She relaxed, breathing hard, sweat now breaking on her forehead, under her arms, beneath her breasts. She soared through the band of tape just below her breasts. What he discovered, or rediscovered more properly put, was that he had pre- What? He- was that he had a pretty good set of breasts. What? 
Dr. Brady, hands still laced across his narrow chest, the chest of a consumptive, Sivkits decided, certainly no breasts there. Sorry, what is this? Is this Dovtroyevsky? What do you mean consumptive? Sorry, is this Anna Karenina? Is this Tolstoy? She was holding the Lucite cube up in front of her breasts. Annie stands in the living room with her phone to her ear and her free hand touching the brooch above her left breast. That time we went to see a woman at St. Jude's. When I kissed her, she put my hand on her left breast. It was the only one she had. The doctors had already taken the other. Oh my God, where did it go? No one knows. Top 10 greatest unsolved mysteries of all time of all Stephen King novels. Duma Key is next. I've read this one. 14 mentions. It's about a rich bloke that has an accident and then he moves to this house and starts painting pictures. But... The island where he lives has supernatural undertones, ooh. She was sitting on a rumpled bed, wearing nothing but a pair of blue panties. The strap of a matching bra trailed across one leg. Her head was slightly bent, but there was no mistake in her features. I had caught her brilliantly in just a few harsh strokes of black that were almost like Chinese ideograms. On the slope of one breast was the picture's only real spot of brightness, a rose tattoo. I wondered when she'd gotten it. The only thing I didn't know is which one of them talked you into getting the tattoo on your breast, the little rose. He nodded against her breast without lifting his head or making a sound. But until he was able to, she would take care of them both. I left them standing on the cobbles beneath the gate arch, between the walker and the wheelchair. She with her arms around him, he with his head on her breast. That memory is clear. Beside the pool was a ripe teenager in a black tank suit. She was all breasts and long tanned legs and dark hair. She wore dark glasses and a tiny sun blazed in each lens. The context of this story is that this is a bloke who's middle-aged and he has a daughter. Right, so why is he talking like, oh, ripe teenager, ripe fresh for the picking there? No, I don't accept this. No. <laughs> and don't anyone any give me any guff of, oh, it's just how men think. No, do better. No. <laughs> No argument there, I said. I studied the photo. Who are these girls? No, don't tell me. The one on the left's Maria. Hannah's on his right. A plus. Hannah's the one with the breasts. She was 14 in 27. It was a lovely redhead whose generously freckled breasts were in danger of tumbling from the top of the fragile pink dress. She had big green eyes. She looked about my daughter Melinda's age. Stop. Before I could say anything, she reached out and gently grasped my fingers. I just wanted to touch the hand that painted those pictures, she said. Those wonderful, freaky pictures. God, you're amazing. She lifted my hand and kissed it. Then she pressed it to one of her breasts. I could feel the rough pebble of the nipple through a thin ga gauze of chiffon. Then she was gone into the crowd. A tired-looking lady in red rayon was working out of a mop. An iPod hung in a sling between her breasts. Pam held out her arms. There was a full moon shining in through the big window, and by its light I could see the rose tattoo on the swell of her breast. Something else new and different but the breast was familiar i know it well come here she said it was ilsie in green shorts and matching halter her feet were bare her face without makeup and puffy with sleep her hair was yanked back into a ponytail the way she'd worn it when she was 11 and if not for the fullness of her breasts she could have passed for that 11 year old what followed was the memory of another girl dressed for another pool. This girl was all breasts and long legs in a black tank suit. She was Mary Iyer, as Hockney had painted her. Gidget in Tampa, she had called her younger self. And then I had it. Can you open that chicken for me and tear off a leg? He did as I asked, and they watched fascinated as I devoured first one leg, then the other. I asked if anyone wanted the breast, and when they said no, I ate that too. The shaft of one of those short harpoons protruded from between the woman's breasts. Under the dome, which was based off the Simpsons film where Springfield is held captive under a dome. Once when he was 13, Junior had spied Frank and Angie standing on that path and kissing, her arms around his neck, his hand cupping her breast and understood that childhood was almost over. Not if the plane had engine trouble and was trying to land on the highway, Duke said. Her little smile faded and her fisted right hand came to rest just between her breast, body language he knew well. He should know it well if he's read any of the other Stephen King novels because all female characters seem to just put stuff between their boobs. Georgia pressed her boot against one of Sammy's breasts, it wasn't quite a kick, and said, shut up. And the line he remembered most clearly was the one about how in a small town we all must know our place. When Angie started standing too close to him when he was cooking or pressing a breast against his arm while she reached for something he could have gotten for her, the line recurred. At first he kissed her back. Angie unlocked one arm long enough to take his hand and put it on her left breast. That woke his brain up. It was good. It was good breast, young and firm. 
not A. It was good breast, young and firm. It was also trouble. She was trouble. Also a faint aroma of perfume. Dodie's? Angie's? He didn't know. What he knew was that his headache was better again and that disturbing white spot had gone away. He slid his hand down and cupped Angie's breast. A flashlight stabbed her in the eyes, but she recognised the narrow head behind it. Frankie de Lesseps. You gave me lip today, he said. Plus, you slapped me and hurt my little hanny. Ew, ick. My little hanny, hmm. And all I did was this. He reached out and grabbed her breast again. Frankie had glommed onto her breast again. Stand still. He pinched the nipple. Oof. Just stand still. His voice roughening, his breathing quickening. She knew where this was going. She closed her eyes. Just as long as the baby doesn't wake up, she thought. Just as long as they don't do more, do worse. He was massaging his hefty left breast. Thibodeau had his arm around the Rue girl, the tips of his fingers on the side swell of her breast. She said something, and they all laughed harder. She finally came to rest on her stomach and breasts. She had tumbled almost all the way to the bottom of the steps. Stay there a sec, Barbie said, although Rose showed no sign of moving. She was hypnotised with the bullhorn clasped between her breasts. Warm, she admitted, then crossed her arms over her breasts and cupped her shoulders. Warm and smelly. Blah. I know, but I can't do it on my own because they won't let me go down there on my own. Maybe if I was a man, but not equipped with these, she indicated her breasts. I need you. Hmm. Oh my God, Nori whispers. One fisted hand is pressed between the scant knobs of her breasts as she looks at that pink freak of a moon. There was time for one more thought. Oh no, he wouldn't. And then a painless boxing glove hit her between her breasts and drove her backward. My throat is starting to feel a bit used. And here was his wife of just 12 hours coming to him, wearing a nightgown that was really no more than a breath of lavender smoke, taking his hands and putting them on her breasts and saying, this time we don't have to stop, honey. Was his hand now resting on the side swell of her breast? She believed it was. It'd been a long time since there had been a man's hand there and it felt very good. Punched me. Not in the shoulder, the way kids usually do either. Cindy hurt me. Cindy hit me in the cheek and Lila punched me square in the right boob. How that hurt. I was just getting my breasts and they ached even when they were left alone. What happened, Barbie asked. And yes, his hand was definitely resting against the side of her breast. He kissed her again. She wrapped her arms around him tightly and gave back as good as she got. And when his hand tugged her blouse from the waistband of her slacks and then slipped up across her midriff to cup her breast, she gave him her tongue. When they broke apart, she was breathing fast. Suddenly, he pressed tighter and harder. The hand not holding her arm groped her breast. Hey, mum, he... Hey, mum. What? Huh? He murmured. Hey, hey, my, my. She felt him spasm, although not the wetness that followed such spasms. Oh, my God. She could still feel Thibodeau rubbing against her bottom, the tickle of his stubble, the fingers squeezing her breast. She told herself not to look at what he'd left on the side of her jeans when she took them off, but she couldn't help it. The word that rose in her mind was man-splat, and she'd found herself in a short, grim struggle to keep her breakfast down, which would have also pleased him, if he had known. If they've got the cash to pay, Pamela says, she has had experience of Joe Boxer when her wisdom teeth came in. He said something about trading one service for another while eyeing her breasts in a way that she didn't care for at all. Full dark, no stars, another short story collection that thankfully only has seven mentions. <laughs> Ramona Norville turned out to be a broad-shouldered, heavy-breasted, jovial woman of 60 or so with flushed cheeks, a marine haircut and a take-no-prisoners handshake. She leaned forward and tapped Tess once above the left breast. She listened numbly as the doctors told her as gently as possible that the lump in her left breast was indeed cancer and it had spread to her lymph nodes. Her breasts, formerly small and firm and high, her best feature she'd always thought, she'd never wanted to look like a hooter's waitress, were now larger, not so firm, and of course they dropped down when she took off her bra at night. What else could you expect when you're closing in on the half-century mark? Did you hear that last bit just then, the sped up bit? Because that is what it is doing constantly. I'm at my wit's end. I kind of think, what if I, I should just re-record the entire last bit using the microphone, but then it's... Oh, I don't know. It feels like all that footage is then wasted. So let's just complete this, shall we? And then move on. But every so often, Bob would still come up behind her and cup them. Ah, uh, and they say romance is dead. You could see she was screaming. She was tired with heavy ropes that bit into her breasts and belly. There was fake blood on her chin and neck. For just a moment, he touched her breast, then, thankfully, took his hand away. Inside the house, he whirled his sport coat onto the tree by the door and pulled her into his arms for a long kiss. She could taste champagne and sweet creme brulee on his breath. It was not a bad combination, although she knew if things happened as they might, she would never want either again. 
Weird flex, but okay. His hand went to her breast. She let it linger there, feeling him against her, and then pushed him away. He looked disappointed, but brightened when she smiled. Next, we have 112263, which is probably one of my favourite King novels. It's about a man who finds a sort of time-travelling step portal to go back to a certain point in the late 50s, and then he decides to stay there until the assassination of JFK to try to prevent it. It's almost more of a romance than a... I I think romance is the main plot of it more than a sci-fi, but it's very good. It's very enjoyable. And there are 21 mentions of breasts. I did. She came out through the gate and walked past me with her head down, holding the baby against her breasts like I wasn't there. But he walked right up to me, close enough for me to smell the old spice he was wearing to try and cover up the smell of his sweat. There were blackheads all over his nose. He looked like a cheerful chipmunk. He grinned at me and stuck out a child-sized hand. On his forearm, a bare-breasted mermaid flapped her flippy tail and winked one eye. Charles Fratty, but you can call me Chaz. Everyone does. Millie wagged her scaly tail and jiggled her teacup breasts. What kind of creature was that? I don't know. One of the people I spoke to was Doris Dunning. Pretty as a picture, Chaz Fratty had said. A generally meaningless cliché, but true in this case. The years had put fine lines around her eyes and deeper ones at the corners of her mouth, but she had exquisite skin and a terrific full-breasted figure. In 1958, the heyday of Jane Mansfield, full breasts are considered attractive rather than embarrassing. On the subject of love at first sight, I'm with the Beatles. I believe that it happens all the time. But it didn't happen that way for me and Sadie, although I held her the first time I met her and with my right hand cupping her left breast. So I guess I'm also with Mickey and Sylvia, who said, love is strange. And sure, I had enjoyed the yielding firmness of that breast cupped inside its thin double layer of proper cotton and sexy nylon. But unless you're 15, an accidental grope at a lawn party does not qualify as love at first sight. Is this going to be the same as that other book where like the guy accidentally grazed the woman's breast and then didn't shut up about it for the next 50 years? That's me, I thought as I turned out the light, totally out of the habit. And then as the crickets sang me to sleep. But it wasn't just the breast that was nice. It was the weight of her, the weight of her in my arms. As it turned out, I hadn't lost the habit of romance at all. Stroking bare skin at the nape that once in another life would have been covered by hair... I slipped my hand first beneath and then around the fullness of her breast and she murmured, oh thank you, I thought I was going to fall. She answered not with her voice but with her own tongue. Without pressing my body against hers, I began to very slowly run my hand up and down the long length of her from where I could feel the rapid heat of her pulse on both sides of her throat to her chest to her breast. She got up on one elbow then took one of my hands and put it on her breast. Beneath it, her heart was pounding and pounding. I'm going to lose my voice. She hadn't bought... And what a way to lose your voice talking for hours on end about boobs. She hadn't bothered putting her bra back on and I could see her breasts lift under her blouse. Her nipples made tiny shadows like punctuation marks against the cloth. Why are like Stephen King's characters, they're all so uncannily observant when it comes to the female upper half. Is this what it's like? Do people just go around like really noting this stuff? Because I'm too busy thinking about me to think about anyone else. Huh? Some? Sure, the usual. She shrugged, her breasts bobbed. I wish I hadn't dressed quite so fast. She would reach beneath the sheet and masturbate him. It never took long, sometimes only seconds. On a few occasions, he touched her breasts as she performed this function, but mostly his hands remained knotted high on his chest. I feel like a competitive foodie or something, hunting loads of water. I remember the day I'd spoken to Frank Dunning's wife, pretending to be a real estate speculator with an interest in the West Side wreck. She had been 20 years older than Sadie Doris Clayton, nay Dunhill, but both women had blue eyes, exquisite skin and the fine full-breasted figures. Both women were smokers. All of it could have been coincidental, but it wasn't, and I knew it. Be courageous, Lee. When they come, stand forward. Show them this. He grabs his shirt and tore it open. Buttons popped off and clattered to the porch. The jump rope girls gasped, too shocked to giggle. Unlike most American men of the time, Der Morenstilt wore no undershirt. His skin was the colour of oiled mahogany. Fatty breasts hung on old muscle. He pounded his right fist above his left nipple. I went to her, reached around to cup her breasts and kissed the back of her neck, totally human. Sadie had pushed the sheet down to her waist and when I came in, the draught of cool air woke her up. She sat, holding the sheet over her breasts and let it drop when she saw it was only me. Mr A, it was Mike. Bobby Jill stood a few paces back with her arms folded tightly beneath her breasts. She looked cold and unhappy. She had become shockingly thin. Her nightgown was puddled at her feet. She heard me and turned round, one arm across her breasts and the other hand over her crotch. I smelled her shampoo, her deodorant, and the oily funk of tension swept beneath it. Most of all, I touched her, hip and breast and the scarred furrow of her cheek. She was there. 
The front of her blouse was soaked with blood, but I could see the hole. It was dead centre in her chest, just above the slope of her breast. More blood poured from her mouth. She was choking on it. We have a Dark Tower book called uh, Wind Through the Keyhole. Five mentions. Her lap was full of needlework. She might have been knitting a blanket, but held before that barrel of a body and breasts so big, each of them could have fully shaded a baby from the sun. Whatever it was looked no bigger than a handkerchief. There she hovered, smiling and beckoning. Her hair tumbled over her shoulders, sometimes concealing her tiny breasts, sometimes fluttering upward in the breeze of her wings to reveal them. She was looking at him from beady, red-veined eyes. Ropes of burning saliva dropped from her jaw and hissed out when they struck the water. Tim could see the gill high up between her plated breasts fluttering as she pulled in air to stoke the furnace in her guts. Is this a dragon? Tim kissed his mother's cheek again and left the room. The widow slept on in the dead man's chair by the fire, her chin upon her breast, too tired even to snore. She was the author of all of his misery. She had bewitched him with her high breasts, slim waist, long hair and laughing eyes. He had believed her hold on his mind would lessen over the years, but it never had. Finally, he simply had to have her. Joyland, I don't know what this one's about, but it has 10 mentions. Rosalind Gold, she said, holding out her hand. But you can call me Rosie. Everyone does. But during the season, she fell into character, which meant she sounded like Bella Bella Lugosi with breasts. I warmed her up and she warmed me up. Pretty soon we were tangled together on the ratty sofa. My left hand curled around her and cupping her braless breast, my right far enough up her skirt to brush against silk. Especially since it's the last one. She stretched, fingers touching the zigzag of the stairs above us and lifting her breasts most entrancingly. I'm out of here in, she looked at her watch, exactly one hour and ten minutes. Only she was the one who got hit by an unscheduled train. Metastatic breast cancer at the age of 47. One mean effing express. Erin watched the ski ball for a while with her arms folded beneath her breasts and a disapproving look on her face. Don't they know that's a complete butcher's game? We climbed abroad. Three of us in a car designed for two made for an extremely tight fit and I was very aware of Erin's thigh pressing against mine and the brush of her breast against my arm. I felt a sudden and far from unpleasant southward tingle. I would argue that, fantasies aside, the majority of men are monogamous from the chin up. All right, Stephen King, tell us how you really feel. Poor Tabitha. Below the belt buckle, however, there's a wahoo stampede who just doesn't give a shit. (laughs) Men, am I right, fellas? I turned back. She was standing straight with her chin raised. Sweat had moulded the shirt to her and she had great breasts. The soft rise of her breasts in one of her seemingly endless supply of cardigan sweaters. He's used that saying before. She was really smiling now, almost laughing. I could see the teeth as well as the dimples. She, not the teeth, her teeth. Not just like random teeth. As long as it's not a thank you flip, it's not, believe me. The last time I had a kid like you, I was a kid myself. She took my right hand and put it on the silky cup covering her left breast. I could feel the soft, steady beat of her heart. I must not have let go of all of my daddy issues yet because I feel delightfully wicked. Remembering the touch of her hands, the firmness of her breast, the taste of her mouth. Mostly it was her eyes I thought about. I doubt that, but it was her boobs. Next up, Doctor Sleep, which is the sequel to The Shining and follows Danny and his life. 14 mentions. The woman from 217 was there, as he had known she would be. She was sitting naked on the toilet with her legs spread and her pallid thighs bulging. Her greenish breasts hung down like deflated balloons. She had put her lips close to his ear and let her breasts press against his arm. Maybe later. Take me to the movies first. Pay my way and buy me popcorn. The dark makes me amorous. She was a presence, and that was putting it mildly. Rose the Hat was six feet tall, with long legs and tapered white slacks and high breasts inside a t-shirt branded with the UNICEF logo and motto, whatever it takes to save a child. Rose looked at her, smiling, saying nothing. Andy met those beautiful grey eyes for five seconds and then had to drop her gaze. But what her eyes fell upon when she did were those smooth breasts, unharnessed but with no sign of a sag. They watched as Andy Steiner's blouse flattened where her breasts had been, as her skirt puffed shirt like a closing mouth. They watched as her face turned to milk glass. Andy woke in the day's first early light of her head pillowed on Rose's breasts. Did you save it? Concetta asked as Lucy opened her blouse and offered Abra the breast. A change of diapers did not quiet her, nor did the breast. She won't take the breast. Why is it sounding like so dramatic? The breast, the breast, or the bottle. You've got it, he kissed her, caressing one of her breasts as he did so. This is my favourite top. She held out her arms. Sari scurried to her and laid her head against Rose's breast. Some of it was shock at finding herself, Rose the Hat, dressed down by a kid whose idea of transportation was a bicycle and whose major concern before the last weeks had probably been when she might get breasts bigger than mosquito bumps. 
Five seconds later, she had her daughter in her arms and was kissing the top of her head, the best she could do with Abra's face crushed between her breasts. He saw him at 15, kissing a girl at the Bridgeton Drive-In and smelling her perfume as he touched her breast and wished this night would never end. I wish this would end because this feels never ending. Mr. Mercedes. I don't know what this one's about. Why did I agree to do this video? I rediscovered there's quite a few books that I've never read, so that's something to look forward to at least when this nightmare is over. She's hungry, Janice said. I can give her the breast. But she's also wet and I can feel it right through her pants. God, I can't, wait, Miss Mercedes. I think I read the beginning of this one. I think someone r runs over these people in a Mercedes. Janice Cray was curled up fast asleep with the baby at her breast. She was wearing a snug turtleneck that cradles a pair of perfectly round breasts. They are not big, those breasts, but as Hodge's dear old father used to say, more than a handful is wasted. Shut up. Her bra is plain white cotton. He holds her by the waist and kisses her between her breasts as she unbuckles his belt and pops the button on his slacks. You know, people have sex, right? People hook up. It's just, it is a lot, isn't it? Oh yeah, that bit in The Simpsons where he's like, give me the bad bars. That's a shining ripoff. It's all coming together. It's all connecting. She hooks her thumbs into the sides of his boxes. He cups her hanging breasts as she does it. She leans forward, the robe gaping to show the shadowed valley between her breasts. Lose 20 pounds and I'll risk you on top. How rude. When the lovemaking is done, she slips into one of his shirts. It's so big, her breasts disappear completely and the, and, tails, and the tails hang down to the back of her knees. His sister pays no attention. She grabs Holly's elbow, jerks her around and hugs her fiercely, mashing Holly's not so inconsiderable nose between her breasts. Don't look. Holly stares at him with her arms crossed tightly over her breasts and her chewed lips pulled down in a grimace. In those days, as a high school freshman, Holly had wanted nothing except to scurry from place to place with her books clutched to her newly arised breast. Rothstein breathed slowly and deeply and his heart quieted a little. He tried to think of Peggy with her teacup-sized breasts. The amount of times I've had to hear it. Teacups, cups are not a unit of measurement, my man. Small but perfect and her long smooth legs, but the dream was as gone as Penny herself, now an old crone living in Paris. I think this bit was repeated from something else. Revival, 10 mentions. This is like his newer works and I haven't reread that many of them. The woman had a dripping bundle clasped to her breast with one arm. Astrid Soderberg. She had silky blonde hair, cornflower blue eyes, and little sweater nubbins that might in the future become actual breasts. We kissed all the way home, and when I slipped my hand inside her coat to cup a breast that was now quite a bit more than a nubbin, she didn't push it away as she always had before. Her strapless evening gown was cut low, the tops of her breasts curving sweetly above it. She was wearing diamond earrings and blood red lipstick. The evening gown was the same, low-cut spangled silver. The inviting curve of bosom was the same, as was the complicated hairdo, but the breasts were now smaller and the hair was blonde instead of black. My hand was squeezing her breast, although there wasn't much to feel because of the heavy parka she was wearing. She touched her chest. She cupped the wasted remains of her breasts. She pressed her stomach. She disappeared into the trees. I knew that if I walked down there I'd find a path, and if I followed the path I'd come to a cabin. The one where I'd lain breast to breast and hip to hip with Astrid Soderberg in another life. Jenny, dressed in a flower print blouse and a white nylon Nancy nurse pants, was standing on the stoop, arms crossed below her breasts and hands cupping her elbows as if she was cold. The amount of times I've heard that one as well. The humming continued. Jacobs put the palm of his hand on her left breast then turned to me. Incredibly, he was gl grinning. In the gloom, he looked like Death's head. I'm just concerned... That if I try and have a normal conversation with someone tomorrow, all I'm going to be saying is blah, blah, blah. Yeah, she stood there with her hands, uh, her arms crossed beneath her breasts, hands cupping her elbows as if she was cold. Finders keepers. Five mentions. Rothstein. It's that exact thing with the teacup. I'm not reading that out again. I've got to save my voice because I can feel it going. His father hulking on his crutches, his eyes red and his cheeks scruffy with beard, his mother holding her purse in front of her breast like a shield and biting on her lips. It was awful. And the worst part, he loved them. Great, Morris said. It wasn't likely Mrs. Muller would die of a heart attack before tomorrow, but it was possible, as another great poet said, hope springs eternal in the human breast. You literally only use that quote so you could talk about boobs. One of the stories Mr. Ricker 
assigned that year was the Rocking Horse winner by D.H. Lawrence. And sure enough, many of Mr. Ricker's young ladies and gentlemen, including Gloria Moore, of whom Pete was growing tired in spite of her really excellent breasts, most excellent, considered it stupid. Yes, that's what I think too. Heinous. She crosses her arms over her breasts and cups her out. Sharp. Go away. Leave me alone. The bizarre of bad dreams. This feels like a bad dream. Nine. Nine. She and Melissa, the girl she'd been grappling with in the mud bowl, had looked at each other, nodded and stood up facing the section of audience from which the yell had came. They stood there wearing nothing but their sopping bikini briefs, mud dripping from their hair and breasts and had flipped the bird at the heckler in unison. The audience had bro broken into spontaneous applause. Probably because they were American. <laughs> I imagine we looked damn funny because I was a shrimp and she was a big girl, at least four inches taller than me and already getting her breasts. Yasmin gives a small nod and lifts D, cradling the baby against her big breasts. D still got the comfort finger in her mouth. Petrov, excellent vodka, Aura McLean says. Her wonderful breasts rise and fall in a theatrical sigh. She spread her arms, showing me how floodgates open. I'm actually losing my mind at this point. It's fine for a few minutes. And then the... And nobody knows why this is. Why has this happened? I don't know how long I've been editing and working on this video for. It feels like a month. And some of you, some people might be like, oh, that's not that bad for a video. I'm so used to just like, just, just, you know, I could do a Metro article video, yeah, and have it edited and uploaded in the same day. I'm just used to working fast because my attention span doesn't work in my favour to the point that, should I even say this? I'm actually going to get tested to find out why that is is it just that i am a lazy person i don't think so because i do stuff oh my god who am i arguing with i'm literally by myself in my flat screaming into the void at this stupid mother flipping video anyway boobs 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 for the last 20 minutes of this no no keep it together and incidentally, giving me a breathtaking view of breasts snugly encased in a black tank top. Think about going on with the obits. What's an obit? Who knows? Would you? Hands still on my shoulders, her light scent in my nostrils, her breasts less than an inch from my chest. And when she took a deep breath, they died. <laughs> Why is Stephen King like so horny? You need to chill, my man. I hope he sees this. Peace and love, Stephen King. Please, I still like you. Actually, because of this video, I've started trying to reread the Dark Tower series because I only got up to book three. So I've started rereading the second one to continue. And I am enjoying it very much. So cheers for that, pal. Not cheers for this bloody video. One with beautiful eyes, long legs, and perfect breasts, I thought as I hung up. I should have known I was in for trouble. Your point? I saw her point. And didn't care. Lol, don't care, didn't ask, mate. The sheet had slipped down to reveal her breasts, every bit as firm and perfect as I expected they would be. <laughs> How firm are these breasts? I'm just imagining they're like... I don't know, what's something that's really firm? Lemons. You know, when you squeeze a lemon, it's really firm. Anyway. I was daydreaming about a girl in my hometown, such long, lovely legs and such high breasts. End of watch. Six. But one of them, Georgina Ross, Hodges presumes, is crying and gripping her shoulders so that her forearms press against her breasts. Sadie reaches up and caresses her breasts, squeezed them. Brady felt a low tingle begin in between Sadie's legs. He was getting her a little hot, interesting, but hardly useful. Cora feels something hit her just below her shrunken breast and thinks, this weirdo son of a bitch just punched me. She tries to get to her feet and she can't make it at first, nor can she take more than shallow breaths. Deeper ones hurt her above her left breast. It feels like something is sticking in there. There's a hole just where the scant swell of her breast begins and in it she can see a black thing. It looks like a dead bug. The voice explains logically and reasonably that she will never have a date, will never be hired for a good job now that political correctness has... Gone bloody mad! Rendered the circus fat lady extinct. That by the age of 40 she will have to sleep sitting up because her enormous breasts will make it impossible for her lungs to do their work. And before she dies of a heart attack at 50 she'll be using a dust buster to get the crumbs out of the deepest crevices in her rolls of fat. Lovely. Gwendy's button box. One mention. Did he send you? Gwendy asks. She's sitting on her bottom now with her feet on the floor and her legs drawn up to hide her breasts. With luck, one look at them is all this sick bastard is going to get. 
Sleeping Beauties, nine. She had been a deeply dedicated cutter at some point in the past, the scars on her breast, sides, upper thighs. As she looked at those long tan legs and high breasts, she flashed back to her driveway. Could it have only been 15 minutes ago? What are you looking at? She had asked. Anton had replied, morning glory. Cherokee askew at the curb and came charging into the ER with her infant twin girls crooked in her arms. A tiny cocoon swaddled face rested in each of the breasts. She was screaming like a fire siren. When he had put on the finishing touches, she said, don't give me that union crap, Peters. One more complaint and you're out. I got one inmate saying you grabbed her breast. I got another saying you squeezed her butt. And I got a third saying you offered her a pack of Newports to suck you off. Wow. If you guys could see me now, I'm basically horizontal on my sofa because I'm fed up. Elaine was already crossing the lawn. There was a woman sitting with her back against the flagpole now, holding a baby to her breasts. She stretched her arms, thrusting forward a pair of breasts that put Claudius to shame. Tiffany was stretched across the front seat of the golf cart. An old St. Louis Rams t-shirt that she had scrounged somewhere lay crumpled on the ground. Her breasts, once little more than nubbins, jetted skyward in a plain D-cup cotton bra. The lycra ones were now totally useless. This was a world where a little girl could walk home by herself even after dark and feel safe. A world where a little girl's talents could grow along with her hips and breasts. Enough. It's the truth. Fritz looked at her more closely, his eyes sliding from her round face to her big breast to her wide hips, then back up again. You're the first woman I've seen in two days. How long have you been awake? The next book is The Outsider, which I have read. The Outsider has five mentions. It is about a boy, a little boy is brutally murdered in a sex crime and murder and these cops are on the case to find out who did it they think that they think the coach in the town did it but it turns out to be more supernatural and you know what i mean i read i read this one yeah it's one of his recent works and i couldn't put my finger on what i felt was wrong of it until someone a reviewer pointed out that everyone sounds the same after a certain point and I was like, oh, no, that's true. Everyone is kind of like, how do man takes his cap off? Like, everyone sounds the same. She did not smile as she approached Marcy. A laminated ID hung from her neck, pinned to her dress, riding the slope of one enormous breast, and as out of place as a dog biscuit on a communion plate was a Flint City police badge. The laughter stopped. One hand cut to her large laugh breast. The other lay flat on her chest above it. Ralph put the heel of his hand against the soft springiness of her breast and pushed her away too. She turned her face against her mother's breasts and wept. She drew the white thing crossbody above her small breasts all the way to her shoulder and swung it with all her strength. The loaded end connected with the outsider's head. Spoiler alert. Elevation, zero. Next one is the Institute with six mentions. The Institute is about kids that, ke that keep getting kidnapped and used for like government psychic operations. Kids who have psychic potential who was super smart or whatever. And you know, I enjoyed this one, but again, Stephen King is about 70 now, right? He's over 70, but he can't write kids anymore because the the this is meant to be a modern day thing. And there's a lot of references to modern things like technology that are just a bit wrong and need proofreading a, like, or, or an editor to go over a bit better. And like, I think there's mention of like someone using AOL or MSN. You know, li little things like that, which really take you out of it. But the, the kids, the children just don't sound like children is what I was saying here. They say outdated terms, expressions. I don't know how else to prove my point. And to be quite honest, this is a long video. So I don't give a shit. You either trust me or you don't. Anyway. Annie was thin to the point of emaciation and Tim took to bringing her small treats from Bev's before punching in for a short shift of unloading at the warehouse complex. Sometimes it was a bag of boiled peanuts or Mac cracklings. Sometimes a moon pie or a cherry tart. Once it was a jar of wickles that she grabbed and held between her scrawny breasts laughing with pleasure. Thank you, son, she said. She was pretty old with a fair amount of grey in her hair and she looked tired. The tag over her sloping left breast said Maureen. Read your report, Trevor. She pushed a button on her computer and the screensaver appeared. A picture of her twin daughters in their double stroller, taken years before they acquired breasts. <laughs> Shut up. Smart mouths and bad boyfriends. Also a bad drug habit in Judy's case. Mrs. Sigsby reminded Luke of his father's oldest sibling. Like Aunt Rhoda, this woman was skinny with barely a hint of hips or breasts. Oh my God, what a bitch. 
Frida almost laughed. Want to go home? To her El Dopo mother and her succession of El Dopo boyfriends. The last one had wanted her to show him her breast so he could see how fast she was developing. 1400 miles away, Tim had just put a bullet between Michelle Robertson's breasts. Another short story collection coming up called If It Bleeds. It's got four short stories in and only one mention. Charlotte has put on the green dress she wears every Christmas, proud of the fact she can still get into it. Her Christmas pin, Holly's and Holly Bellaries, is in its accustomed place over her left breast. Book called Later, five mentions, five minutes, we're almost there, we're almost there, I can do this before my camera runs out. The books really were a saga in that they told me one continuing story of a cast of continuing characters. They were strong men with fair hair and laughing eyes, untrustworthy men. Why did I say that funny? Untrustworthy men. Untrustworthy men. I had the same cadence as, what's her name? Julia Fox. When I was in Uncut Jams, that's what I said. Oh God, disgusting. Untrustworthy men with shifty eyes, noble Indians who in later books became noble Native Americans and gorgeous women with firm high breasts. Everyone, the good, the bad, the firm breasted was Randy all the time. You're one to talk, Stephen King. She rewound and fast forwarded. She filled in the picture. One night, deep into their second bottle of wine, I heard her tell Liz that if she had to write another sentence containing a phrase such as firm thrusting breasts tipped with rosy nipples, she might lose her mind. Stephen King, you're hardly one to talk. The baggy sweatshirt beneath the coat showed only a hint of what had been generous breasts. At a guess, I'd say she was 40 or even 50 pounds lighter and looked 20 years older. Liz had been right about that. To my child's eyes, the bog film was almost hallucinatory. A good suit might have disguised at least some of his flab, but he wasn't wearing a suit. He was wearing a pair of gigantic boxer shorts and nothing else. His immense girth, jumbo man breasts and flabby arms were crisscrossed with shallow cuts. His full moon of a face was bruised and one eye swollen shut. And finally, we have the last book. I did it for the second time. I did it the second time I've had to say this sentence. We got to the last book. Well done, me. Thank you. Thank you, fans. Billy Summers, number nine. Now, I like, I read Billy Summers recently as soon as it came out. And I, in fact, I read it so quickly that when I went online to see what other people thought of it, barely anyone had read it. I read it like that fast and that quickly. I really enjoyed this one. I thought, I thought it was nice. I thought it was touching. I thought it was way better than some of his recent stuff. I thought it was way better than The Outsider, for example. But there was something that <laughs> I didn't appreciate. Billy Summers is about a hired assassin doing his last job and then getting out of the industry. At the same time, he decides to write his memoirs. So, there is indeed a cherub peeing endlessly into a pool of water and a couple of other statues, Roman soldier, bare-breasted maiden, that are lit by hidden spots. This next bit is about his stepfather, brutally murdering Billy's sister. Listen to how it's described. He didn't tackle Bob Rains while Bob Rains was kicking his sister and stepping on her and crushing her fragile chest on which no breasts would ever appear. Billy was supposed to take care of her. Take care of your sister. The little sister is like a toddler, like three or four, some age like this. And during her brutal murder, it's being described as her chest is caving in on which no breasts would ever appear. I don't think that's the main issue, Mr. King, that, oh no, this kid's not going to grow up and grow boobs. I think the issue is the child has died. Thank you. Though who am I to tell Stephen King how to write anyway? Who am I to tell him what to do? He's the multi, multi, multi millionaire. He knows better than to drop his head because Dana or Reggie might notice, more likely Dana. But he, no, he, but he moves up besides a plump woman who is panting and holding her pocketbook to her breast like a shield. Billy knows right away who worked with the police artist. Irv Dean, the Gerard Tower security guy, is an ex-cop and it seems his observational skills are still intact, at least when he's not reading motor trends or examining breasts and butts in the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. Billy kneels behind her and gets an arm around her midsection. He uses her breast as a brace and hauls her up in front of him. She starts to slide. He gets the shirt off in time to catch her and keep her from falling onto the floor. Her plain white cotton bra is askew, one breast covered and one out because the strap that's supposed to go over her left shoulder is broken. Of course, she hasn't suffered multiple bullet wounds in the legs like poor old Johnny Caps, but there is blood on her. And now he sees three bruises on one of the girl's small breasts as well. Narrow bruises. Somebody grabbed her there and squeezed really hard. There are two more finger shaped bruises on the left side of her neck and Billy thinks of her saying, no, don't choke. He lays her back down, blows out her breath, and arms sweat from his forehead. 
His The shirt is bunched above her breasts. He pulls it down in front of her. Trip is funny. Trip is charming. Trip is complimentary. And he's a perfect gentleman. He kisses her after the movie date, but it's a wanted kiss, a desired kiss. And he doesn't spoil it by sticking his tongue in her mouth or grabbing at her breasts. I did it. I did it. It's over. It's not quite over because I'm going to now tally up the amount of usages of the words of the term. 786 mentions. I might have calculated that wrong, but I'm tired. I'm fatigued from doing this. I can't really see straight. So that was 70 stories or what or whatever you want to call them. On average, 11 mentions per book. And that is it. I'm done. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for coming along with me on this journey. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Make sure you check out my merch. Please like, comment, subscribe if you made it to the end of this video. This is ridiculous. And I can't wait to have to edit this. Check out my podcast channel and my second channel. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.